it is now 6 p.m. on June 1st, 2021. And this is the City of Iowa City formal council meeting. I'm gonna wait for the counselors to turn on their cameras. All right, we're on item number one. Roll call, please. Burgess? Here. Mims? Here. Solly? Taylor? Here. Teague? Here. Thomas? Here. Weiner? Here. Welcome everyone and welcome to everyone that is watching this uh, via social media. We are on, and anyone that is here present on this Zoom as well. We're going to go to item number two, which are proclamations. 2A is the Jewish American Heritage Month, and this will be read by Councilor Weiner. Thank you, Mayor. Whereas Jewish American Heritage Month has its origins in 1980 when Congress authorized and requested the president to issue a proclamation designating a week in April or May as Jewish Heritage Week. And whereas President Carter issued the first proclamation in April 1980, which spoke about the bountiful contributions made by the Jewish people to the culture and history of the United States. And whereas on April 20th, 2006, President George W. Bush proclaimed that May would be Jewish American Heritage Month, month formalizing the crowning achievement of the more than 350 year history of Jewish contributions to American culture, and whereas the Jewish American story is an essential chapter of the American narrative, it is one of refuge from persecution, of commitment to service, faith, democracy, and peace, and of tireless work to achieve success. As leaders in every facet of American life, from athletics, entertainment, and the arts, to academia, business, government, and our armed forces, Jewish Americans have shaped our nation and helped steer the course of our history. We are a stronger and more hopeful community because so many Jews from around the world have made Iowa City their home. Now, therefore, on behalf of Bruce Teague, mayor of Iowa City, I do hereby proclaim the month of May 2021 to be Jewish American Heritage Month in Iowa City and encourage all residents to join in this observance. I recognize briefly it's no longer May. We had a, an, an unavoidable delay um, nevertheless, uh, um, proud to proud to to be able to have this proclamation and accepting the proclamation is Esther Hugenholtz, the rabbi of Congregation Agudas Achim in Coralville. Thank you very much, C Councillor Weiner. Thank you very much to the entire city of Iowa City and to the mayor and all the councillors. Um, I think you can probably hear me, but not see me. Um, so I will be a voice emerging from the darkness. Um, and I just want to say that in this time where we see an uptick in anti-Semitism and an uptick in divisions and hate crimes in our society during you know, this unprecedented pandemic, it is so comforting and so heartening to know that the city of Iowa City takes our inclusion seriously, takes our representation seriously, and takes our contribution seriously. And this is a bomb to the soul of our community to be honored as such and to be remembered as such. Even though our presence is numerically not very large in this community, the Jewish community of Iowa City has a history going back over a hundred years and have always sought to contribute to the civic, cultural, political and economic life of this community. I'm reminded of the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah ch chapter 19, uh, 29, where the prophet himself issues a letter in which he says, and seek, well, seek the welfare to the city to which I have dispersed you and pray to the eternal on its behalf, for in its prosperity, you shall prosper. Our history, is a template for many of the experiences that are part of the human experience, as well as adding its own unique flavor and color to the human experience. And I'm so proud and happy that we get to enjoy 
and be enriched by Jewish culture and history in our community, and that we get to pray for the welfare of the city and to share in its prosperity and in its good fortune. I'm grateful to you all, and thank you very much, and I am honored to accept this proclamation. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Really appreciate you being here with us today. Thank you. Item 2B is LGBTQ plus Pride Month. Whereas lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer or questioning, intersex and asexual, people come from all walks of life and all racial, ethnic and religious backgrounds. And whereas LGBTQIA, people are everyone's family members, friends, coworkers and community members, cisgender, heterosexual people, all have the opportunity to become another meaning for the A in the LGBTQA, I'm sorry, LGBTQIA, alas, and whereas the city of Iowa City is committed to upholding diversity, social justice, equity, and mutual respect and safety for all who live, work, do business in, visit, or enjoy this community. And whereas the city of Iowa City has recognized by the Human Rights Campaign Municipal Equity Index for the past seven years for its outstanding support of LGBTQIA individuals in public policy, services, and leadership. And whereas the city of Iowa City will show that commitment and support by offering free yard signs for residents to display, flying pride flags at City Hall and City Park Pool from June 1st through June 30th, and lighting Park Avenue Bridge in rainbow pride colors on June 30th. And whereas the City of Iowa City Human Rights Commission will show its commitment to keeping LGBTQIA history alive by screening the film Stonewalled Forever, followed by a panel discussion with a question and answer session on June 28th. And whereas with the goal of coming together in person at last, Iowa City Pride, www.iowacitypride.org slash will hold its citywide Pride celebration on October 1st through 2nd, 2021. Now, therefore, I, Bruce Teague, Mayor of Iowa City, do hereby proclaim the month of June 2021 to be LGBTQ plus Pride Month in Iowa City. And accepting this today is on behalf of the Iowa City Pride um, Committee is the president, Tony. Welcome, Tony. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for having me. Um, I have much to say. It's, it, I, Iowa City has always been real supportive of our community here. Um, you know, it continues to strive to be better every time I talk to someone in the city. Um, and that's something we greatly appreciate. Um, we appreciate the yard signs and everything you're doing. Um, it's been a, been a tough year at COVID of not being able to do a lot of things. Um, but we're excited for October. October also marks LGBTQ History Month. And we just think it's a great way to, to start the month with the festival, um, as well as having the students there, um, since it is our re-celebration of our 50th. And Pride did start in October as well in Iowa City um, at the homecoming march. So. We have a lot to be thankful for and um, a lot to be, still be fighting for. Um, just a quick reminder that, you know, Iowa has introduced, did introduce 15 anti-LGBTQ laws this past year at the beginning of legislation. So we have a lot to fight for. And um, we are real thankful that Iowa City backs us up on, on all, our, all our fights. Um, so thank you guys once again. Thank you. And as he, uh, Tony noted, this will be the 50th celebration, although it will be in the 51st year. So thanks to Iowa City Pride and the committee for all the work that they're doing. 2C is National Gun Violence Awareness Day. Whereas every day more than 100 Americans are killed by gun violence, alongside more than 230 who are shot and wounded. And on an average, there are more than 100 and there are more than 13,000 gun homicides every year. And whereas Iowa has an average of 281 gun deaths every year, with a rate of 8.7 deaths per 100,000 people, and has the 43rd highest rate of gun deaths in the United States. 
And whereas support for the Second Amendment rights of law abiding citizens goes hand in hand with keeping guns away from people with dangerous histories. Whereas gun violence prevention is more important than ever as the COVID-19 pandemic continues to exacerbate gun violence after more than a year of increased gun sales, increased calls to suicide and domestic violence hotlines, and an increase in city gun violence. And whereas people across the United States will recognize National Gun Violence Awareness Day and wear orange and tribute to Idea Pendleton, a teenager who was tragically shot and killed at age 15 in January of 2013 to recognize her 24th birthday and the loved ones of those victims of violence. And whereas the idea was inspired by a group of Hydea's friends who asked their classmates to commemorate her life by wearing orange, they chose this color because hunters wear orange to announce themselves to other hunters when out in the woods. And orange is a color that symbolizes the value of human life. And whereas anyone can join this campaign by pledging to wear orange on June 4th, the first Friday in June in 2021, to help raise awareness about gun violence. And whereas we renew our commitment to reduce gun violence and pledge to do all we can to keep firearms out of the wrong hands and encourage responsible gun ownership to help keep our children safe. Now, therefore, I, Bruce Teague, Mayor of Iowa City, do hereby proclaim the first Friday in June, June 4th, 2021, to be National Gun Violence Awareness Day and encourage all citizens to support their community efforts to prevent the tragic effects of gun violence and to honor and value human lives. And to receive this is Templeton Hyatt on behalf of Moms, Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America. Welcome. Thank you, Mayor Teague and city council members for the opportunity to be here and for issuing the proclamation recognizing Gun Violence Awareness Day. My name is Temple Hyatt and I'm with Moms Demand Action Johnson County Group. Uh, I've been a Johnson County resident for nearly 40 years. I'm a mother of two adult children. I'm a veteran and I became a gun violence survivor when my nephew died by gun suicide in 2014. Moms Demand Action is a bipartisan movement of Americans, we like to say mothers and others, advocating for public safety measures that can protect people from gun violence. We are not anti-Second Amendment. Some of our volunteers are in fact gun owners. We are against gun violence and support sensible solutions. We also offer an educational presentation called Be Smart that helps parents and adults normalize conversations about gun safety and take responsible actions that can prevent child gun deaths and injuries. As Mayor Teague mentioned, Wear Orange originated on June 2nd, 2015, what would have been Hadia's 18th birthday. Now it is observed nationally and in the years since, participation in Wear Orange has increased tenfold. The color orange has a long and proud history in the gun safety movement, whether it's worn by hunters in the woods of Pennsylvania, activists in New York City, or Hadia's loved ones in Chicago. Orange honors the more than 100 lives cut short and the hundreds more wounded by gun violence every day. And it demands action because here in Iowa, gun violence is increasing at a much higher rate than the national average. It's even worse for people of color. Black people are 13 times more likely than white people to die by gun homicide compared to 10 times nationwide. In Iowa City, incidents of shots fired and those injured have increased more than 200% in 2020 over the previous year. I'm here because I don't want anyone to find themselves directly impacted by gun violence, if you haven't been already. And I don't want anyone to join the ever-growing group of gun violence survivors. Thank you again for issuing this proclamation and honoring those in our community who have died from gun violence. You're also acknowledging the many people in our community who have been personally impacted by gun violence, including me. Thank you for honoring our lives and joining us in this important work. Together, we can end gun violence. And I'm happy to answer any questions from the council 
um, that you might have about our group and our efforts here in the community. Thank you so much for being a part of uh, this time with us today. I really appreciate um, hearing your personal story and our hearts go out to you. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. We are at items number three through seven, which is our consent agenda. Can I get a, a motion to approve the consent agenda as amended? So moved, Thomas. Second, Taylor. And if anyone from the public would like to discuss this item, please raise your hand. I will call upon you. I see one person that wants to address um, items that's on the consent agenda. And also we have a, a new little device that we're gonna try out is a timer. And so I'll ask our city clerk Kelly to give this a shot. Um, if anyone else wants to uh, address an item on the consent agenda, please raise your hand now. Otherwise I will call on Traore, Mohammed Traore, who is our, um, who is the chair for our TRC. Welcome. Well, thank you for recognizing me, uh, Mayor Teague. So first and foremost, in terms of the consent agenda, just wanted to clear up. I don't have it directly in front of me. I'm pulling it up at the moment just to ensure nothing um, is on here from, from this item. But is, is this an appropriate time to talk about the Excluded Workers Fund or the MRAP? Um, that will be at our um, next item on the agenda, which is uh, public comment. Okay, then yeah, I'll, I'll just speak during during that time then. All right, yep, thank you. Um, would anyone else like to address a topic that is under the consent agenda? If so, please raise your hand. If you're waiting to do public comment on an item that is not on our agenda, we ask that you wait for the next item, which I'll open up the floor then. And I'm gonna call Audrey Keith and you'll be allotted three minutes. Welcome. Hello. Okay, I wanted to make sure um, I was going to talk about the um, public transit hearing and like proposed changes. I also don't have the consent agenda in front of me. Yes. So my phone. Yep. Is that something on this part or for public comment? Um, that will be coming up later on our agenda, the transit. So I'll call gotcha. upon you. Yep, thank you. All right, thanks for the clarification. Yes, you're welcome. And then we have Yale. Welcome. Hello, I also wanted to discuss public transit like Audrey. Yep, and that'll be coming up later in the agenda. All right, Thanks. thank you. All right, anyone else, want, anyone want to discuss a topic that's within the consent agenda? Please raise your hand. Seeing no one, house <laughs> discussion. Roll call, please. Fergus? Yes. Mims? Yes. Tilly? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teig? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Weiner? Yes. Motion passes seven to zero. Item number eight is community comment. And this is a time for uh, the public to talk about any item that is not on our agenda. And I want to, if you wish to talk about something not on our agenda, please raise your hand at this time. And if you're on the phone, please press star nine. Otherwise, if you want to talk about an item that is not on the agenda, please raise your hand. I, oh, yep. I, I wanna give people opportunity to raise their hand so I'll know how, um, how we need to adjust time if, if needed. I see that there are nine people on right now. So we can um, give 
three minutes to each individual at this time. Should there be more hands raised, I may have to adjust it. And so I'm gonna welcome Nicholas followed by Muhammad. Uh, thank you, Council. Um, I'd like to address a couple of things. I'll put my hand down now. <laughs> um, first off, well, two things that happened last week. First of all, I guess I'll go with the, the latter one first and then the earlier one. So on Tuesday of last week, as you may or may not know, um, I was, the Iowa City Police Department used Johnson County's MRAP, colloquially only known as the tank by residents, during a raid that was meant to, I guess, terrify residents of the South District, a tank that, by the way, this council has said in the past they oppose. And after you put forth minimal, basically no effort to deter its use, you washed your hands of the situation, saying it's entirely within the county's control. However, it has recently come to light through correspondence with Supervisor Rod Sullivan, the chair of the Johnson County Board of Supervisors, that in fact, not only does ICPD have, quote, the keys, as he said, to the MRAP, they can use it without even notifying the county in any way. So we, the public, have to wonder, why did you lie to us and say it had nothing to do with the city? Or perhaps why did the city manager, Jeffrey Fruin, as well as interim chiefs, Brotherton and Campbell, lie to you? Because if Supervisor Sullivan is correct, there's actually quite a bit more the city could be doing, namely taking the keys away, preventing the MRAP's use either through ordinance or, some, or a general order. The other thing I want to address is the fact that on Monday of the same week, the city's public works department in conjunction with ICPD contracted the clearing of as many as seven encampments of unhoused persons around the city, in many cases without proper warning, some cases they were warned, it's unclear as to how far in advance, and thereby destroyed most of the personal belongings that they need to survive. Now, <laughs> IFR, along with a lot of other, so, you know, lefty anarchist organizations throughout the city have actually been working with um, Iowa City Mutual Aid to try and restore the personal property of the individuals involved. And I guess it, it, it annoys me so much that we are constantly in the position of having to pick up after your brutality, after the fact that you don't really care about large swaths of residents of this community. And at, at the bare minimum, what I would like from all of you if, you, if you're not actually going to do anything about the housing crisis in this city, could you at least not stand in the way of the people who are actually trying to make things better? That would be nice. Thanks. Thank you. Welcome, Mohammed, followed by Audrey. Hello. Thank you very much for recognizing me, Mayor. Uh, so I just wanted to say at this time, first and foremost, when it comes to the MRAP vehicle, that it is a mine resistant ambush protected. So it's a term for United States military light tactical vehicles produced as part of the MRAP program designed specifically to withstand improvised explosive device IED attacks and ambushes. The United States Department of Defense MRAP program began in 2007 as a response to the increased threat of IEDs during the Iraq War. Uh, light armored vehicles uh, such as the MRAP, when it comes to these things being made for war, I just really don't see the need for that to be within the South District, especially after you know, not only experiencing while I lived in the South District, a place I lived from 2002 until February of this year, uh, you know, being used for drug raids and drug busts. That doesn't seem like a military application in any way for me. I do know that Department of Homeland Security cleared it for other things, but I just still, once again, do not see the need for using it for, for things such as this. And the, the community members in the South District said the same, went to their crime and safety meeting last week. They expressed multiple times about how terrible it was to have to have their kids subjected to that and to have to constantly see that and the trauma that they have experienced, I've experienced, my family's experienced from it is just absolutely awful. One, in addition, my mom, a uh, major reason she did want to move out of the South District as well is because of, of this vehicle. She talked about how anytime I was in the area or anytime she saw me going out or whatever, that she was just afraid of what could happen to me. And yeah, again, this just should not be in Iowa City, should not be used in Iowa City, absolutely no need for it. The South District is not a war zone. 
drug busts do not require these things. There are no mines or IEDs in these situations. There are no ambushes whatsoever. Next, I would like to speak on the Excluded Workers Fund and why this needs to be supported by yourselves and also the Johnson County Board of Supervisors. Mainly, last week at our Truth and Reconciliation Commission meeting, we had multiple members of the at the Iowa City Catholic Worker House talk about all the things they'd gone through from the pandemic. Most notably, want to talk about one of the people saying that she had lost lung capacity and is being forced to essentially off of government assistance uh, after also not receiving stimulus checks. And this is a terrible situation because she obviously has bills to pay. She literally cannot safely work due to her condition. And there's so many people in, in this area that are in that position. People are going to be losing homes. People are going to have their credit scores ruined. People are going to basically fall further into poverty and despair. And if we do not support this now and get this passed and these funds there, then I fear for how people in Iowa City will go in the future. Thank you. Uh, welcome, Audrey, followed by Annie. Hello, everyone. Um, so first of all, I want to say that um, uh, thank you, Nicholas and Mohammed, for the issues that you brought up. I full, wholeheartedly agree with what you have said about these two things, about the MRAP and the people, um, the houses people whose like stuff was thrown away. Um, so thank you so much for taking the time to speak on these issues. Um, the thing that I came here to speak about today was the um, proposed changes to the public transit system, um, specifically. Audrey, um, yeah. yep, that is, yep, that's an item on the agenda. It'll come up uh, later. Okay, well, either way, then I will say um, I wanted to speak a little bit, I guess, about um, the the affordable housing issue um, as as it has related to me personally, and I'm simply reminded of it by these stories of these people whose uh, items were simply, uh, were just tossed out, you know, it's the only thing they had or whatever. Um, but just that, yeah, uh, Iowa City has always had a problem with being able to provide affordable housing. Um, and we know that it's always been a trouble, a problem for renters. And my partner and I uh, recently had to move unexpectedly. Our landlord had told us that they would no longer renew our lease. And we were like, well, you know, we're kind of tired of having to deal with landlords. We're going to attempt to buy a house. And even, um, you know, while again, like that's extra difficult right now because of COVID and things like that, but just even dealing with the housing market here in Iowa City for a first time home buyer is extremely stressful and many of the homes are not affordable and those that are affordable are bought up extremely quickly it seems to be like they're being bought by flippers or people who are just going to rent them out and not people who are actually going to live in them and that has been a very frustrating experience um and i wish there was a way to make it better i don't have any suggestions i just want it to be known um that the struggle continues even if you are trying to not be a tenant any longer. That is all, thank you. Thank you, Annie. I'm sorry, thank you, Audrey. Welcome, Annie, followed by Stephanie. Hi, my name's Annie. I live in Iowa City and I have a few concerns I'd like to share with council tonight. First, I would like to comment on Iowa City Public Works and ICPD's clearing of several encampments of unhoused people last Monday. The city claims there was 48 hours notice to this destruction of shelter, but evidence does not show this. Individuals that lived at those camps said themselves the postings were placed in hidden spots that they could not see. I myself delivered lunches to these areas that Saturday and did not see a single posting. Many of these people's belongings were disposed of during a pandemic. Much of said items were recently purchased with their only stimulus checks or new items donated by the community. City Council should not stand for these anti-poor actions and replace all the items stolen from these constituents at the expense of ICPD's funding. Another thing I would like to comment on is the tank owned by the city. It's gotta go. There's absolutely no need for military grade equipment in our community, unless the city is intending to terrorize its people. It has come to light that County Supervisor Rod Sullivan has said that ICPD quote, has the keys to the tank. City Council and City Manager Fruin have direct control over ICPD. You've all stated your discontent with the tank, now remove it immediately. 
Finally, I would like to reemphasize the movement in town in favor of an excluded workers fund, hazard pay, refugee resettlement, housing cooperatives, and Sunday transit. Do better city council. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome Stephanie followed by Taylor. Am I unmuted? Yes, you are. Okay. So I'm Stephanie and I am what I will call the voice of Iowa City Mutual Aid Collective. And um, it's interesting because Iowa City Mutual Aid Collective was not born with the idea that we were gonna be a permanent fixture in Iowa City. We were just a group of people pulling our resources together to help our neighbors through the COVID crisis. Then we started speaking weekly and almost daily with people who didn't want to reach out to the nanny and nonprofits in town because they are distrustful of the relationship these nonprofits have with the ICPD. That's the city council's fault. When these organizations are encouraged to collude with ICPD to secure city funds, they are perceived as a part of the power structure that sends tanks into residential neighborhoods and subcontracts out to demolish people's belongings because we all know the city council has more power over these situations than they let on. And you know, that's why the friend plan is so ridiculous. Instead of offering people options to a visit from the ICPD when they reach out for help, they can just expect more police involvement in the future as varying nonprofits in this town hire police light to reach out to the community. And I guess I would just echo what Nicholas said. You know, it took us a long time to build trust with some of these individuals. They're suspicious of people who come as helpers. There are members of the Iowa City Mutual Aid Collective who don't speak out as much as I do because they're afraid to do so. I'm, that's kind of why I got picked to be the voice. I'm not afraid to do so. While it's obvious that the city council doesn't want to offer the kind of help the community is asking for, you can at least not try to make things more difficult for those of us who are willing to, because honestly, now this is a long-term gig and I'm gonna keep doing this and keep providing those things as long as the city council and the city organizations keep taking things away from people. Thank you. Uh, welcome Taylor followed by David and welcome Taylor followed by Dan. Sorry about that. Hi, I want to talk about how council claims to be opposed to ICPD having military grade weapons and equipment and yet there always seems to be a reason why nothing can be done about it. We're sick of the excuses. You either can do something or you don't care, or perhaps you have so little control over ICPD that you have no knowledge of the violence and intimidation tactics it uses against marginalized people in our city. If that's the case, seems like we should eliminate it just to be safe. The fact also that people in the city have to scrape together their resources and their time to help people who are unhoused because of the apathy of this city is shameful. Finally, I wanna back everyone calling attention to the Excluded Workers Fund. We couldn't have gotten through the past year without essential workers and their jobs still involve so much risk. It would be shameful to leave them out and use this money where it isn't needed. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome Dan, followed by David. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, welcome. All right, um, what a fancy timer. Uh, it would be cool if the city government put as much thought and effort into listening to our concerns as they did limiting our ability to speak at these meetings. Um, I would like to speak in support of the Excluded Workers Fund. Advocate, advocates for it have spoken at the last several council meetings, and it's very concerning that no officials have made any indication that they're moving to support it. It's good for everyone in the community, not just excluded workers, and I don't understand what the holdup of council is. Um, I would like to now speak to Mayor Jeffrey Fruin. Oh, wait. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I mean, City Manager Fruin. I sometimes get confused because based on the way Jeffrey operates the city and its departments, it seems like he's the dictator of this community. That's a problem because nobody casts a single vote for you, Jeffrey. And the and the majority of people disapprove of the direction you're taking this city. Um, all right, now that's all off my chest. Let me tell you what the people demand. They are fed up with Jeffrey's personal militia. I mean, the ICP, ICPD, sorry again. Uh, the it, Jeffrey makes this all confusing for me. Uh, forbid ICPD from participating in any law enforcement action using the tank owned by the, the county. Also, it is a tank. Look up pictures of it with guns mounted. That's a tank. Um, it was used in a raid in the Southside District a week or so ago, and an email 
Uh, County, Sol County Supervisor Sullivan implied that IC ICPD Chief Liston is using the tank whenever he pleased. Mr. Mayor, you published a letter opposing the usage of the tank, and you and the council are in a unique position to forbid ICPD from using it. So I humbly request that you guys use your authority to do it and to do so. There is a Johnson County Supervisor, Supervisor meeting on Thursday morning at 9, and I encourage you all, especially you, Mr. Mayor, to back up your to show up and back your demands. Um, tell the county to get rid of their tank. Um, the number to call is 319-688-8013. Um, and you have to, at the meetings at nine, you have to call in five minutes ahead of time. Um, and also I would just like to speak about the ways that the city has uh, thrown out the homeless people in the homeless encampments. I mean, it's it's very interesting to me that like at the beginning of this meeting, y'all were talking about how, oh, it's pride month, ha ha ha. Like let's love all of the LGBT people in this community when LGBTs make up a huge percentage of unhoused people. And treating unhoused people like you did last week by pushing out the homeless encampments, I mean, it's despicable. It's an act of violence, not only against un the unhoused population, but also the LGBT people, which make up a huge chunk of it. Um, all right, thank you, bye-bye. Thank you. Welcome, David, followed by Ron, Ron Nelio. Uh, hello, am I coming in through? Yes, welcome. Thank you. Um, I guess uh, yeah, my name's David. Uh, uh, gosh, I mean, I really don't like to just parrot what other people have said here. Excluded workers fund is important. Um, the way the homeless people have been treated here, especially with the clearing out of the encampment is just, I mean, it, it's like actually frightening to think of a tank going around being used to scare poor people. Um, but I, I guess what I wanna use my time for is just ask like, what people think activists in Iowa City are doing. Like we spend hours working out ways that we can distribute food to people, that we can raise awareness for programs that people really want, but they don't think the council will listen because they're used to tuning into sessions like these where everyone is really upset and nothing ends up happening. Um, and I, I wanna know like all, all this time and effort, all the marching that we were doing last year like, where are the people who want this tank? What are they doing to keep the tank in the city? Like, if it, if it isn't in this, the council's hands, whose hands is it? Like, it's, it's not the county. The county says it's not theirs. And I mean, if you want to go to war with the county about this, tell us, like, where's the communication? It just feels like we're constantly being left to scramble for bits of information. And even when we do trust what you have to say to us, we have no faith because there's never any follow through. And then that just damages the trust. I've, I've come to so many of these meetings feeling nervous and uncomfortable, but still wanting to speak, uh, hoping that there's some good faith that I can share with the council that they can say, oh, you know what? I have this. I am an elected official in this town. I'm not just a civilian. I can do something about this, but we, we just don't see you doing anything. And I mean, yeah, my perception is the only thing I've got. Maybe you're doing, excuse me, doing a million things, but we're not seeing it. We're not seeing it anywhere. And especially not when homeless people are being scared away with the tank. So like, I mean, where's the army of 80 year old racist boomers who are like, yeah, we really need this tank. Like, I mean, it, seriously, we have no explanation for any of this. Manager Jeff Fruin penned an excellent letter uh, during the beginning of the protests, talking about how the city had failed in a number of ways. And in good faith, I tried to take that to mean that there was going to be a rapid shift in how policy was made in the city. And yet the opposite has happened. We've only seen policy slow since then. We, <laughs> Again, our perceptions are all we have, but clearly there's a problem with communi communication here. And I don't mean the staff at the communications department. They're hardworking caring people, but I mean, there's just nothing here. Um, that's all I got. Thanks. Thank you, David. Welcome, Ronil Ronilo. Please pronounce your name for me, followed by Harry. Sure, uh, my name is Ronilo. Um, I'm a PhD student um, at the UI. Um, 
this is my first time talking in one of the city council meetings. I've listened to a lot of them, uh, but but this is my first time talking just because I'm so horrified at what went on uh, with the homeless people, as uh, everyone else is um, mentioning. So I, I just want to say uh, the treatment of homeless people in the city is 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 really awful. So if you remember a, a, a while back, there was this thing where you all are putting uh, partitions on the benches so they can't sleep on there. Um, and now you're, you're terrorizing them with a tank. So I, I just like to appeal to your, your empathy to, to do whatever's in your power to stop doing these things to terrorize these people who are already so vulnerable. And also I, I'd like to appeal to your morals, religiously speaking, because I think statistically speaking, there's a good chance uh, some of you are Christians, so I'd, I'd like to offer uh, uh, something from Proverbs 14.31. It goes, whoever oppresses a poor man insults his maker, but he who is generous to the needy honors him. So I'd like to, uh, those of you who, who are Christians to keep this in mind um, when you think about how to treat uh, poor people in this town. Uh, thank you. I, uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you, Renilo. Renilo. Sorry, Renilo. Welcome, Harry. Hi, uh, I'm here also to basically tell you how awful, how awful a decision it was to have this tank go into a homeless encampment basically and steal everybody's possessions. Um, and I think that this is just a perfect example of what people people talk about and well about what people talk about when they talk about abolition and this can be used to demonstrate alternatives to policing right here because I want to ask I want to ask you Mr. Mayor I want to ask you and I want to ask every single person on the city council and I want to ask every government official that has the power of state that has the power to stop this kind of thing I want to ask you one question how is the money that's spent on this tank useful to the people who are suffering in homelessness in, in poverty how is that useful? Could that money have been better spent perhaps on housing these individuals, on feeding these individuals, on getting these individuals back up on their feet? Do you think the money that was spent to have police go in there and rob human beings of pretty much their only possessions, do you think that was a useful, do you think that was a good use of money or do you think that was a waste of money? Do you think that that helps people? Because honestly, I, I, I'm not really damaged by the presence of homeless people. You know, I guess if you're like a bougie bitch, you might be like a little discouraged by seeing them. But if you really want to solve the problem, how about you help them? How about you help them get to where, where you're at? Instead of just, I don't know, inflicting violence on them. Instead of enforcing poverty on them. How does that help? That's all I've got to say. Fuck the police and fuck you too, man. Thank you, Harry. Would anyone else like to address uh, this time with com community comments for on any item that is not on our agenda? Seeing no one else, I'm gonna move on to item number 9A. And this is rezoning um, Hickory Trails Estate. Ordinance conditionally rezoning approximately 48.75 acres of land located south of North Scott Boulevard and west of North First Avenue from interim development single family to low density single family with a planned development overlay zone. And I'm going to open the public hearing. And I'm gonna invite uh, Councillor Thomas um, just to make a statement at this time. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I would like to make a statement for the record regarding my status as a board member with the Friends of Hickory Hill Park. Uh, I resigned as a board member of the Friends of Hickory Hill Park on March 31st, 2021. Uh, I have consulted with the interim city attorney and I do not have a, a legal conflict of interest. Uh, I, in addition, I have not been actively engaged in board meetings and activities since February of 2020. And I believe I can fairly and impartially consider the application. 
Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask that staff, Danielle, uh, give us uh, an update. Thank you, Mayor Council. Uh, Danielle Sussman, Neighborhood and Development Services. So as the mayor stated, this is an application for rezoning. Uh, this slide shows the border of the approximately uh, 48.75 acres bounded in the white outline. The applicant in this case is Axiom Consultants on behalf of Joe Clark and Nelson Development. The land is currently owned by ACT. Um, this exhibit shows again that same area uh, shown in relation to the surrounding zonings uh, uh, districts. Uh, in green in the, on this slide to the west and south is Hickory Hill Park. To the north and orange is the Oak Knoll development. Uh, most of the land to the north of North Scott Boulevard is, is the ACT campus. And then there's a neighborhood uh, adjacent to the west, Hickory Heights, and the Hickory Trail neighborhood to the east. Um, again, this is a rezoning from um, interim development to a development zone that would allow for development. Um, in this case, the low density single family residential with the planned development overlay. The planned development overlay is required because there are sensitive features on the site. Um, and that brings with it the um, concept plan, which looks an awful lot like a plat, but which is not yet a plat. It's intended to be a, a preliminary sensitive areas development plan, much like a site plan. So it gives a preview of the way the development will um, anticipate and uh, be designed with those sensitive features in mind. It does also allow for waivers as part of the process. Um, there are only there's only one waiver to development standards requested through this entire uh, rezoning, and that is to the height uh, for the buildings uh, to be included in the senior living component. They're requesting a five foot height increase from the 35 feet. That's the base zone to 40 feet instead. Otherwise, there are no variations for the remainder of the um, development. A little bit of background. Um, the rezoning application was presented in February and March to the Planning and Zoning Commission. At the time, staff did recommend approval with the five conditions that are presented here and that I'll go over at the end of the presentation. Staff support has remained uh, unchanged throughout the application process. However, the Planning and Zoning Commission did have concerns with the original proposal and uh, encouraged the applicant to revise their OPD plan and provide a direction on the things that they thought needed to be revised in order to pass to garner a favorable recommendation from that body. Um, the applicant did choose to revise their plans and resubmit them to the Planning and Zoning Commission. And at this point, the application that the concept that's before you tonight has received a uh, recommendation of approval by the Planning and Zoning Commission. So this is the current uh, concept expressed with the OPD rezoning for Hickory Trail Estates. <clears throat> to the north of this, to the top of the slide is the north. This shows the uh, layout of what would be single family lots along a street that connects North Scott Boulevard to North First Avenue. Um, again, on the west side and south side is the boundary with Hickory Hill Park. In the southeast corner of the development is the senior living uh, proposed development as well. As I mentioned, there are sensitive areas in this vicinity, and so uh, the plan also includes an accounting of those sensitive features and how it will be is designed to meet our sensitive areas requirements to avoid impacts to wetlands, which there are two of in this vicinity, a stream corridor, which also transects the property, woodlands and steep slopes. So those are color coded in various ways um, throughout this uh, application. The major changes between the two uh, proposals, and I'll bring those up side by side for you, is essentially on the left hand side was the initial proposal and on the right hand side is the proposal that has been recommended by the Planning and Zoning Commission to, for your consideration tonight. Uh, the applicant removed a condo style development that was uh, initially proposed here, increased the uh, single loaded aspect of the uh, street that goes through here. Um, for 70% of its length to be uh, have houses only on one side. So initially houses were shown on both sides of the street. Um, they've reduced that down to be single loaded for um, a majority of that street. That also resulted in the dedication of land in outlet A increasing from approximately 10 acres to 14 acres. There's been an addition of a third pedestrian crossing across the street. Um, there's been some addition of sidewalk connecting the senior living facility. Um, the additional changes that were made also reduced the impact to critical slopes um, and preserved additional woodlands 
and increase the buffer around the string corridor. Uh, when staff reviews rezonings, there are two general criteria that we look at every time, including the comprehensive plan and compatibility with the neighborhood. Um, this district, this area of the Iowa City does have a district plan, the Northeast District Plan. So on the left is the uh, future land use map concept expressed there. And then again, the proposed development to compare to it. Um, the future land use map uh, does indicate this area primarily for uh, residential development and in the comprehensive plan does allow for a mix of types of uh, housing, including uh, senior living uh, and more intensive uh, residential development along major streets. Um, in this uh, design, the, what was expressed uh, was, the, again, single loaded streets working with the landforms in the vicinity, trying to um, uh, achieve a conservation design where basically development follows ridge lines and stays away from sensitive features. Again, staff feels it's been accomplished with the proposed um, concept. In addition, the comprehensive plan also has housing, transportation, and environment, energy, and resource goals. And this development is meeting those by providing housing choices, um, interconnecting the street network, sidewalk network, and trail system. And again, trying to achieve the conservation design and avoid sensitive areas. With the plan development review, there are specific criteria in addition to those general criteria that need to be met. I'll just go through those one by one here. Um, they include land uses. So um, in this case, single family housing and senior living uh, do meet the land uses um, and the density uh, requirements of the base zone. It's actually well below the density uh, maximums allowed by the base zone. Um, it includes 42 single family lots, again, none of the condo uh, anymore, and about 135 bedrooms of senior living. As far as design, uh, the through street connecting north to east um, and homes and in individual lots is a kind of house scale development as well as the black scale development of the senior um, living component. Um, and again, protecting sensitive areas. As far as open space, it does provide the required private open space on a lot by lot basis in the single family lots and also uh, achieves the um, open space requirements for the senior living complex, for base, which is based on a per bedroom uh, land, uh, land reservation. And there is, like I said, a significant dedication of land for a public park expansion to Hickory Hill Park. In addition to those open space requirements, there's also a buffer distance being maintained between the senior living facility and the condo development to the east, um, acknowledging that they are of different heights and um, uh, transitioning between the two with use of landscaping. And as far as streets and utilities, um, there is traffic calming being uh, required of this development and is intended to be provided. Um, also, there's sufficient capacity in the street network and uh, adequate utilities and sewer and water available. So as far as next steps, we're at the rezoning stage here with the OPD RS5 rezoning. Um, there would still need to be planning, uh, preliminary and final planning, and then as the development process proceeds, site plan review of the multifamily or senior living component and building permits. So the, as I mentioned, the Planning and Zoning Commission does recommend approval of this application for the rezoning, um, subject to five conditions um, that staff included. Um, those include a woodland, woodland management plan for outlot A, the provision of the trail connections that I mentioned, traffic calming uh, in the development, uh, including um, the uh, narrowing the streets so pedestrians can cross them and elevating certain parts of them, installation of right-of-way trees, and then uh, a final plat to, uh, which is required really because the subdivision um, is the boundary by which the rezoning is recorded. So those will be, uh, those are proposed by staff. So based on a review of our, the relevant criteria general and specific staff made that recommendation at its May 6, 2021 meeting by a vote of six to one, the Planning and Zoning Commission concurred with staff's opinion and also recommended approval. Uh, the this, Conditional zoning agreement has been signed and received, and a good neighbor meeting was held in December. Um, that concludes my remarks, Mayor. I'm happy to answer questions. Jump right in with questions. Um, I had a question, Danielle. You mentioned that this is the, the development overlay plan, and there would still need to be preliminary and final plat plus a site plan for the senior housing. 
Um, can you just kind of walk us through like what, what those steps would entail in terms of the changes that were made from like February to now? Or would we see potentially the same scale of changes or the types of changes? If you could just kind of anticipate through that process what could change? Sure, we would anticipate very little would change. In fact, if much changes, we would deem that it no longer meets the preliminary um, sensitive areas development plan, which you're reviewing and approving tonight, and it would need to go back through a process. Um, so there are some minor changes. Uh, as I get into final design work, you know, some boundaries change a little bit, but we wouldn't uh, expect to see like the number of lots increase or the locations of those lots. Um, the alignment of the road could shift a little bit, but if it's uh, in, impacting the amount of buffer between things that we anticipated, um, staff would really uh, flag that as no longer um, substantially in compliance with what you approved. So what we anticipate is that the prelim and final plats will look up substantially like what you're seeing tonight in this preliminary sensitive areas development plan. Thank you. Danielle, I had a, a question, this is John, about the um, senior living component of the project. Do we have any preliminary idea of what the assessed value of that component of the project will be? Uh, I do not. Staff doesn't review that as part of the components of the zoning code. That might be a question for the applicant tonight, if you'd okay. like to know that information from them. Uh, Councilman Thomas, I did. Um, Real quickly, just take a look at the assessed value of some um, other senior living facilities. And um, I, I think we could get a little bit more precise answer for you at the next time if the applicant doesn't have that tonight. But um, I'm seeing ranges in that probably seven to 10, or I'm sorry, seven to $15 million of assessed value. Um, when I look at senior living facilities, now this is a little bit different. It has a memory care unit and each site's going to be uh, a little bit different, but you know, if you ballpark 10 million or so, I think you'd be pretty pretty good from an estimate standpoint. But we can look to refine that a little bit, um, talking with the um, Iowa City Assessor before your next meeting. Thanks, Danielle. Can you maybe go back to the maps and clarify for us and for the public, because I know there's a lot of concern from the public and I want to make sure we all understand and they do how much buffer um, there is going to be from the current park boundaries and exactly where and how much land would be added to the park please Let's see if I can Sorry to make you have to watch all these. This is probably the best one. So, um, Councilor Mims, the green area here uh, is outlot A. That's all uh, being added to Hickory Hill Park. Um, the distances between the current park boundaries are variable throughout here, but they're essentially the depth of a single family a lot because that's what the developer removed uh, along these areas um, in order to create a single loaded street. It's probably a little bit less than a single family a lot. Um, it ranges anywhere from... <clears throat> 35 feet to 116 feet, it looks like, um, in some areas is a little bit larger than that. I and so that would basically be up to like maybe the corner of that last lot on the west side, because obviously it's much larger as you go north from there. Right. And yes. And it's what about 14 acres that's being added to the park potentially? Correct. This agreement. And Danielle, that's that's the 13.96 acres uh, that was mentioned in the PNZ meeting to satisfy the neighborhood open space requirement. So that that green space, that's what you're talking about. 
that's what the developer right. would dedicate to Hickory Hill? Okay. Right. So every time there's a development, uh, we either we, we anticipate park uh, needs and we either collect a fee in lieu or have dedication of land. Um, you probably see mostly fee in lieu up until this point. In this case, uh, this development has uh, land that is um, sufficient in size and shape and quality to be quality parkland and is desirable to the city to acquire as park. So in this case, it's a land dedication. And when you look at that north part of there, um, those lines that are on there indicate change in elevation and also a stream corridor. So there is significant elevation change and significant um, tree growth in all of that area between this and the Hickory Heights development to the west, correct? That's correct. It's uh, generally slipping down to the blue line, which is a creek, and the black boundary, which is the wetland, and then back up on the other side a little bit. But and it is it is woodland, and it is quality woodland that the parks uh, see value in uh, maintaining. Okay. Thank you. I don't hear any more questions for you. All right, thank you. Would anyone like to address this topic from the public? Um, I'm not sure if we have a developer here. We might invite them up at this time. Um, and I'm not sure the name of the developer. That representative, um, I yeah, see David Terry. Uh, Mike, Mike Welch from yeah, Michael Welch, please. Yep, welcome. Good evening, Mayor Teague and, uh, and Council. Um, thank you for allowing us a chance to speak tonight. Um, and Danielle, thank you for um, a good uh, outline and presentation. You kind of covered uh, much of the items that I wanted to make sure were addressed. So um, you've made uh, my job a little easier. So thank you. Um, tonight, I am here uh, representing the developers, uh, Joe Clark and Jacob Wolfgang. Um, Joe is responsible for the single family portion of the development, uh, while Jacob's with Nelson Development and responsible for the senior housing um, portion. I know Joe might not made it. He was uh, at a child's uh, sporting event tonight. Um, I believe Jacob is on the call along with um, representatives from the rest of his design team, including um, Andrew Alden with AG Architecture, and then uh, Ann Stanfield with Ecumen, who will be managing the property. And then um, Adam Tarr is his attorney with Pew Hagen and Pram here locally. Um, I do want to kind of, I guess, address uh, for council a little bit about this, this project. Um, as Councilor Mim said, there's been a lot of uh, public um, comment on this. and. We anticipated that at the beginning of this project, and um, you know, we, we did hold a good neighbor meeting. Um, at the start, we we kind of expanded that boundary. Um, so, by recommendation by staff, it's uh, you notify neighbors that are within 200 feet of the property. We extended that to a 500 foot buffer to kind of encompass Hickory Hill Park, and then we included it further to the east to really um, capture the entire Hickory Trail neighborhood, and including. Um, the new Tamarack Ridge development as well to the east. So really um, anticipated there would be um, a lot of interest from the public with this development being adjacent to Hickory Hill Park um, during the, the development of the Northeast District Plan and the Comprehensive Plan over the years. There's been a lot of public um, opinion and, and involvement and concern about how this would develop. Um, so we again wanted to make sure that we, we invited those people into the process early uh, heard their input early and were able to take take a, you know, that into account in our design. Um, so as as Danielle said, we did go to um, P and Z with an initial design and um, did not get the outcome we wanted on that, but got some good feedback from the commissioners and the public. Um, came back with a, another revised design. They had a few more changes to make and got to the plan that that you see tonight. And really. Um, the bulk of those the feedback that we got was the concern of how this development would impact uh, Hickory Hill Park and people's enjoyment and use of the park. And where we 
settled on was really it came down to that that desire for the single loaded street um, on the south and west part, portions of this development. And as Danielle said, you know, it's a, a significant piece of this development in that it's over 2,200 feet of single loaded street, which is um, not something that you see in other places within Iowa City or other other cities in general. Um, just from a, a comparison standpoint, that distance is kind of the equivalent of if you go at the intersection of Hickory Trail and First Avenue and go east in the existing development, that's essentially the same length as Hickory Trail is all the way to where it uh, tees into Tamarack Ridge or Tamarack Trail, sorry. Um, so a very significant portion of single loaded street, which, which is a benefit for Hickory Hill Park and that and creating a, an opportunity um, for the public to gain additional access points to Hickory Hill Park. Now, we have two provided, one um, on the south end, just near lot, across the street from lot two, essentially. And that'll be a line up with an existing connection of a path that comes out of Hickory Hill Park and onto this private property. And then again, on the west side, there's a, a location um, probably about across from lot 12, west of lot 12, where the um, public currently does kind of cut across the property there and we're providing a connection uh, there as well. Um, that was one of the concerns that came up too with, with connections to Hickory Trail Park during the Planning and Zoning Commission meetings was making sure that those access points um, to Hickory Hill Park um, felt like they were accessible to the public. Um, it was pretty clear that people were not comfortable with trail connections that came down side yards between two houses. And so what you see before you tonight, again, is really um, the efforts of the developer and the development team um, taking that feedback from the commission and the public and working that in. Uh, during the process, we we heard a lot of feedback from the public, like I said, that was concerned about how this would impact the park. Um, and I, I think it's a, a real testament to how well you know, how hard we worked um, to address those concerns and that a group like Friends of Hickory Hill Park um, at our, our final planning and zoning meeting, um, while they weren't able to get consensus among the group to speak in favor of the project, uh, they, they felt like, or they expressed that they felt like the development team addressed enough of the concerns and kind of got, got a good plan. Um, I think we all recognize that that on a site like this, there's no perfect plan, there's no perfect development that's going to make all parties happy. Um, but again, I think we can, we feel very proud and, and very comfortable that the plan they came up with finds that balance between um, those who would who would like to see this property not change and those who um, recognize that this property has has been slated for future development like I said, for the last 20 years, as long as that Northeast District plan's been out there, there's been um, discussions of how this property would develop. Um, the last part that I think uh, is worth just addressing and, and touching on quickly is that the addition of this senior living uh, facility on this property, clearly um, the comprehensive plan does not show one large building on the property, um, but it does show multiple smaller apartment buildings now, we looked at this and saw an opportunity to provide to a, a type of housing um, that that we feel that Iowa City needs and, and that there's there's demand for, and that is the assisted living and memory care living for, for seniors. Um, again, we worked, worked with the architect and the development team to find a way to bring that, that facility onto this property in a way that was respectful of the existing neighbors and respectful of people using the park and, and create a facility that would fit in into the terrain. Um, the building that's there is three stories on the north end, but it does step down to a single story on the south end and that's closest to Hickory Hill Park. Um, and I don't know if it's possible for me to share my screen, but we do have renderings we can share. Otherwise I know they're in your packet too that show um, what this building will look like, and um, and we can speak more to that too uh, this evening. But I think with that, that um, kind of covers the items that I really wanted to highlight. And I'm happy to take any questions. And then I know that um, 
Adam Tarr would also like to speak after me on behalf of the developer. Any questions for Michael? And I do see Adam Tarr. I'll go ahead and invite Adam Tarr. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. I, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, council members. Thank you, Mike, as well, and Danielle. I just want to quickly uh, say, yeah, I'm here on behalf of uh, Nelson Development in favor of this requested rezoning to OPD RS5. I am also here, though, as a resident of the east side and a supporter and a regular user of Hickory Hill Park. We have lived in the same home for the last 12 years, just a few blocks south of the park. And I know that the park was a huge positive in choosing this as our forever family home. And I cross paths with many members of the public, staff, council members in the park with my family and my dogs. And knowing that I expect to see my neighbors in the park for the foreseeable future, I wouldn't be before you today advocating for this development if I couldn't say without hesitation that this is a very, very good plan. In fact, sitting on my desk next to me is one of my favorite pictures of my daughter and one of our dogs that I took at the picnic table on top of the hill on the north loop of Hickory Hill. And so I just want to emphasize that this is a, a special plan. I know Mike conceded that no plan is perfect and that the idiosyncrasies of the, the lot always have to be taken into account. As I would say, you know, this isn't quite a unicorn of a plan, but it's darn close. I note that the planning and zoning approved and recommended this by a six to one vote. Staff for Parks and Rec in the City of Forester have also supported this. Parks and Rec staff notice that are noted that the addition of 14 acres to Hickory Hill Park abutting Scott Boulevard will increase the park size by nearly 8%. And it will actually also improve the eco diversity of the park while adding trailheads and frontage on Scott Boulevard. In fact, fully 28% of this property will be dedicated to Hickory Hill Park via Outlot A. Outlot B, which is to the northeast of the park, will be a conservation easement for the stream side there. Together, Outlots A and B comprise almost 38% of the development that has been set aside for conservation, and the majority of the woodland tree cover on the property will be preserved. So I think this is a, a huge win for Hickory Hill, and I'm pleased as could be to get to be before my neighbors and the council to propose such an expansion and improvement to a beloved park. I also am happy because I can speak to the fact that there's a, a second interest, community interest, that is addressed in the comprehensive plan that this also addresses, and that is, as Mike mentioned, the need for livable senior housing in this community. As somebody who works quite a bit with guardianships and conservatorships, I know all too many families who have aging family members who need the kind of care that ends up sending them to Solon or to Tipton or somewhere else. But being able to bring in a quality senior living facility here with memory care units as well is a huge plus for the community into the east side. And it will also introduce good neighbors to the northeast, northeast boundary of the expanded park both families and seniors who are going to choose to live alongside all of us because like us, they are drawn to Hickory Hill Park. And that means we can count on them to cherish the park and to protect it as much as we all want to. And so we can probably expect friends of Hickory Hill Park to grow as new stewards are welcomed into this neighborhood. It's clear listening to Mike that Axiom really listened to the city and to the neighbors and took their input to heart. And so I'm asking the council and other community members who are listening tonight to really listen to the plan and see what's being proposed and set aside preconceived notions about what development is or what should happen in terms of uh, a spot here that, as Mike said, has been targeted for development. It's no longer going to be a de facto adjunct to the park. And uh, ACT has made it clear with its signage and with its uh, it's fencing that the days of, of traipsing across that are going to be done, except for the fact that those trails have been incorporated now into the expanded park and into the, the trail heads. And so 
this really is a situation where it's the, the best of all alternatives. And the reality is that we have an opportunity here to address the geriatric crisis that Iowa City is facing and to expand Hickory Hill Park and to bring in good neighbors and good stewards in the process. It's just too good of an opportunity to pass up. And so on behalf of Nelson Development, we are urging the city council to recognize the opportunity before us here and to go ahead and approve that ordinance to rezone to uh, OPD RS5. Thank you. All right, thank you. Councilors, any questions for Adam or Michael? Hearing none, I'm gonna ask that the SC public have raised their hand. Is there anyone else that would like to address this topic from the public? Please raise your hand now. Hands are continuing to raise. If you're on the phone, press star nine, if you would like to speak. I see eight hands raised as of now. Okay, we're gonna um, allow each uh, individual three minutes. If there are more hands that become raised, I may adjust that time. There will be a timer and um, we ask that you stay within that three minutes. And I am going to welcome Terry followed by Nicholas. Hello, Mayor. Uh, I'd like to say hi to John, Pauline, and Susan, who I had the honor of serving on the City Council. So I'm very familiar with the, the whole process that you're going through. I think there's most of the points have been brought up, so I hate to repeat those, but I think the assisted living Having elderly people in an area with other families is extremely important that we can have that blend of ages going through there. I'm lucky enough to live on North Dodge Street. I'm surrounded on three sides by Pappy Dickens Preserve and Hickory Hill Park. Like, like uh, your developer said, we're all good stewards of that. But when you live next to it, you become a better steward. Uh, you feel a little bit of ownership. I know when the deratio went through, we had our man that comes up and takes care of our trees. We had some tree damage on our house. He came up and cut down all what we call the widow makers, the limbs that were hanging down. He went over into Pappy Dickens Preserve and cut those down at our expense to make it more safe for all the, the people to use. I think it's very important that uh, we have all these new access points to the park. It's extremely important. It's a beautiful area to walk. We have probably one of the largest urban parks you know, anywhere. And it's, I don't think it's being used as much as it really should. Uh, I did get in on the last part of the planning and zoning meeting. I thought uh, a lot of great points were brought up, uh, went past the second, the second or third time, six to one. And I know the council in the past, when they get that kind of recommendation, usually vote. And I'm just hoping that they all vote for that. Um, just a quick Congratulations to Eric Goyers. I know you that's up on your agenda soon, and I just want to tell him congratulations. I hope you do uh, let him in there. And uh, I just feel very, very blessed to live where I do. And I think this is a great addition to Iowa City, Eastern Iowa City. It's a great infill project, and it really meets all the district plans and just it's such a good project. I just hope it passes. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, Nicholas, followed by Dan. Uh, hello, Council. Um, I too would like to thank you for all of the efforts that you have recently put forward to underwrite the property values of single family homeowners. Sorry, a little sarcasm there to begin this. First, well, actually, first of all, I'd like to note that you gave the developers an inordinate amount of time to speak, and we once again are subject to this stupid timer. Here's the thing. Developers get 
constant attention from the city all throughout the development process. But we as the public have extremely limited points at which we can address you if you're even listening at all. So this whole timer thing is absolutely ridiculous. It is incredibly hypocritical the way you treat us compared to the way you treat business interests in the city. So just, oh, I can't believe you sometimes. But when it comes to the issue of a single family rezoning, just like Again, the hypocrisy of it. You all go on again. And I mean, in other instances, you talk about how much you hate single family zoning, how much you don't want it to happen. And yet a development that is like two thirds, if not three quarters, single family houses. You're like, oh, yeah, sure. That sounds like a great idea. What happened to affordable housing? What happened to that? Oh, I guess. Well, you see, here's the problem. Every time one of these things comes up, you make a decision based solely upon the thing that is right in front of you. And whatever principles you have just get completely thrown out the window. It's like, oh, yeah, well, you know, staff worked on this and we did a good job and we think we put together a good plan. And, you know, it's all come together. And it's and bullshit. Absolute bullshit. Because the thing is, and this was actually brought up in one of the emails that was sent to you as a late handout, that it is your role to drive how development occurs in the city, not to simply sort of massage what developers want into, well, whatever you happen to think your principles are on a given day. And so as a result, what you end up doing is precisely what I said at the beginning, is you underwrite the property values of the richest people in the city. Meanwhile, those of us who actually have to deal with the housing crisis that you do nothing about, <laughs> I, I, I'm just so furious with you about this. I don't, I'm just gonna stop talking because I'm just lodging the same objection that I always do. You have no principles when it comes to housing. You have no idea what you're doing. You should reject this. You're not going to, but there's nothing we can do to stop you because as it's clear from these stupid timers, who you really care about. You care about the developers. You don't care about the rest of us. Thank you. Welcome, Dan, followed by Allison. Hi. Um... I would also like to reiterate the fact that like the council is giving the public a timer, but not the developer. I mean, like, <laughs> good job, city government. Like, we know who you prioritize. Mm -hmm. uh, if I start my own development company, can I like not have a timer when I speak? That would that would be dope. Um, anyways, the senior housing aspect of this is super cool. I dig it. I really do. But that's the best thing I can say about it. Here is the thing. It seems like this government is not interested in creating more affordable housing for folks. The Iowa City Metro has the highest property values and rental rates out of all metro areas in the entire state of Iowa. Unfortunately, our community is filled with rich folks who kind of who, who have an elite housing, who create an elite housing crisis. And we are in the middle of a public housing crisis. And um, it looks like this development plan just expands that. Um, it turns Hickory Hill Park into the backyard of a bunch of rich folks. And honestly, it only serve, it only is gonna expand this elitism. And Adam Tarr discussed the geriatric crisis, which I agree is major and that this senior housing will fix. But like, damn y'all, like what about the affordable housing crisis? Um, and also, it really sounds like Friends of Hickory Hill Park is opposed to this. It sounds like the neighbor, neighbors and the people who are going to be most impacted by this are against it. Aren't they the most important folks to consider, along with the most disadvantaged folks in this community? Um, and it seems like the people who are telling you, oh, the neighbors are happy, are the ones with the most to lose if this does not go through. So I would seriously urge the city government to actually find out, okay, are the neighbors happy with this? Because I mean, as one of the developers even admitted, there's not a uniform consensus. I love Hickory Hill Park. And one of the most appealing parts of it is that it seems like it's just, I can go and get lost in the wild when I'm still in Iowa City. And it, this plan seems like it encroaches on that. And despite the claims of, oh, land being added to Hickory Hill Park, I fear that this plan will fundamentally change what I love most about the park, which is just going in, getting lost, and trying to find my way out of it again. I mean, that's the cool thing about the park. Um, and just, I, it would just be so cool 
if we could have more affordable housing, more affordable multifamily development, so close to that park. Because I imagine most of the housing that's close to it isn't very affordable. I mean, just use your heads and your hearts, y'all, for real. Thank you, Dan. Welcome, Allison, followed by William. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. Um, I also want to complain about this three-minute timer since you did let the developers go on and on with their disingenuous comments. But I suppose there's no way to change that at this point. Um, I wanted to say that I have been attending these meetings, the PNZ meetings, since the beginning on this development. I found the whole process to be very sneaky and underhanded uh, from the very start, and I'll tell you why. Um, but just to say, first of all, that the comments from the public were overwhelmingly raised in concern with this project and against many aspects of this project, including those from Friends of Hickory Hill, despite the developers just claiming otherwise. So some of the things that really concerned me throughout this process um, were, number one, this, this whole thing with ACT making threats, sending threatening letters into the PNZ Commission, um, and then they follow through with those threats by putting up, you know, barbed wire fences and signs all over, claiming that they were basically holding that land hostage and they were going to take it away from everyone unless this development goes through. Secondly, the PNC Commission itself um, was led by a person who introduced this project as if it were a foregone conclusion. They said things like, this will happen and this is inevitable, rather than starting with, is this going to happen or is this a possibility? There's a huge conflict of interest there, not to mention the conflict of interest I saw in many speakers who, who spoke in favor of this plan during the PNZ meetings, uh, because they were either somehow a part of ACT or somehow uh, part of the development team. So that was also very disingenuous. Now I understand the city, especially Jeff Fruin, really wants this to happen since it's gonna make a lot of nice tax money. Um, but let me just tell the council while you're listening, hopefully, the two biggest problems with this plan. The first one is there needs to be a more setback, much more setback. And that's uh, the buffer that I think council member Mims was asking about. This is for um, concerns with people using the park, but also for wildlife. You spent a ridiculous amount of money slaughtering deer the last couple of years. Uh, and then now you're just going to green light this development so that people will have absolutely no buffer between their yards and the deer that are going to come in, eat their plants, and then they're going to want you to kill them all over again. And then lastly, Terry Dickens talked about all these new access points to the park, but that's not reality. If you notice on that plan, there's nowhere for people to park. It's not going to be like Bloomington Street ac uh, access. It's going to look like 7th Avenue entrance, which is essentially a bunch of rich people get, feeling like they own the park and they have the park in their own backyard. And that entitlement comes with the cost of making everyone else feel left out. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, William, followed by Anne. Okay. I'm not seeing William transferred over. I don't hear you. Hello? Hello? Hello. Thank you. Welcome. I'm sorry. Uh, thank you. I'm asking the city council to deny this proposal. The city's comprehensive plan envisions low density single family residences on this property. It has been zoned as interim development, single family residential. On December 7th, we received a letter from Axiom Consultants on behalf of the developers, Nelson Developers and Hickory Trail Estates. We were informed that the developers were seeking to rezone the area to low density, single family residential for the Hickory Trail Estates project and medium density, multifamily residential for the Nelson Development Project. We were told that medium density multifamily residential zoning would be required for the construction of the senior living center. A number of community neighbors expressed their concerns regarding the rezoning proposal, which included the construction of the three building complex containing 120 occupancy units. 
Following this good neighbor meeting, the developer reported their rezoning request to planning and zoning on February 18th. They requested a rezoning for low density single family residential with a planned development overlay. Medium density multifamily was substituted with the term planned development overlay. They also increased the number of occupancy units for the senior facility from 120 to 135. Proposing 135 dwelling units on 9.38 acres comes out to 14.4 dwelling units per acre, which is not low density. Many members of the surrounding communities have also raised concerns about the traffic intersection of Hickory Trail and North First Avenue. The developers are proposing a throughway connection from Scott Boulevard, traversing the park, and connecting with North First Avenue. Again, this is not what the city comprehensive plan envisioned. The comprehensive plan proposed two separate access entries into the property, one coming off of Scott Boulevard, the other entry would be an extension of Hickory Trail or the First Avenue. Both these access entries were to end in separate cul-de-sacs and not be a throughway. I believe the wisdom behind the comprehensive plan was to minimize the traffic liabilities at the intersection of Hickory Trail and First Avenue and minimize the impact on Hickory Hill Park. Unfortunately, there are two developers involved here with two completely different plans. One developer, Hickory Trail Estates, is planning low density single family residences, which is what the comprehensive plan projected. The other developer, Nelson Developer, is planning a medium density multifamily multi-story three building complex. The two completely different proposals, there should have been two separate rezoning applications. This application was denied twice by planning and zoning, and we requested a third time. The senior living center should be located along the major street like Scott Boulevard, not Hickory Trail, like Danielle Sitzman said. I respectfully request the counselors come to the site to see what it's like trying to exit Hickory Trail on the west side of First Avenue. The intersection is at the base of Thank two you. descending roads. And Thank you. Welcome, Ann, followed by Casey. Hello, is, can everyone hear me? Okay, yes, I would like can. to thank um, Mayor Teague and the Iowa City Councilors for this time to speak. Um, my husband, Bill Sinan, and I have lived in the neighboring Bluffwood area on Cypress Court for 27 years. Um, the, um, as Mr. Welch pointed out earlier, um, there has been a significant interest from the um, neighboring communities, as well as the entire Iowa City community. But I would let, just as Allison said earlier, this has mostly been opposition to the plan. Um, this is not just senior housing, which we would have no objection to. This is a very large, a huge, as the developer once called it, um, three building complex with 90 outdoor parking spaces and will end up being as high as four stories with the pitch of the roof that's taken into effect and 135 units. Um, we, um, as I'm sure you are aware, the rezoning plan was brought to the Planning and Zoning Commission three times be, um, between February and May 2021 and was denied twice by the, by the Planning and Zoning Commissioners, first by a vote of six to one, and then by a seven to zero unanimous vote. Opposition to the plan by neighbors and the Iowa City community was strong and has remained strong. And the commissioners called the attendance at the meetings unprecedented with well over a hundred people attending each of the first two meetings. I believe 140 was the attendance at one of the meetings. We are not opposed to the development of this land which is a beautiful piece of property situated between two established neighborhoods, Hickory, um, Hickory Heights and the Bluffwood neighborhood, and it is adjacent to Hickory Hill Park. While a diversity of housing choices is always desirable and is desirable to us, the location of multi-unit structures, including a large senior care facility, should be carefully considered so as not to destroy the existing neighborhoods of single family homes. The Iowa City Comprehensive Plan 2030, which was reaffirmed in 2013, says that the property should be zoned for single family homes. We ask you as counselors to support the comprehensive plan and deny this request by the developers. Thank you very much. 
Thank you. Welcome, Casey, followed by Tom. Thank you, counselors. Um, uh, Casey Court here. I am the chairman of the board of Hickory Hill Park, or Friends of Hickory Hill Park. And we generally operate on a consensus basis. Um, and while we didn't have consensus on this last plan, it's mostly due to the fact that um, this thing has been rushed through and through um, up until 2019. What has happened when the, when the commission denied a thing? They have to start all over. So this is a fairly new process. And so they can come back month after month. And we just didn't have a quorum to meet because you know we're volunteers. We have lives, we're in the middle of a pandemic. So that's why we didn't have a consensus on the last plan. Um, the last time we did have a consensus was that stick to the district plan, stick to the comprehensive plan. And what that shows is that there are two cul-de-sacs coming from the north and coming from um, First Avenue. And you know the commission has said, and I realize that there's some things in code that cul-de-sacs are not, they, lit, they, they don't want cul-de-sacs. But at the same time, in either the February or March meeting, I don't remember which one it was, they approved a cul-de-sac off of Rapid Creek Road. So I, I don't quite get that. So the owner has called us um, anti-development or they've called the opposition anti-development. We have never been anti-development. We have always agreed um, that they have the right to develop this land, it's private property, but you do it in consensus with the district plan and the Northeast district plan. So they should have done their due diligence when they bought the property, the plan existed, so they know what could be developed. I think they're trying to maximize profits and get the most money out of that, meaning that the developer has got to push as many houses into that property as they can to make a profit. So it's a little concerning why the first two plans um, got so far in, in the planning process. I mean, why they just completely bypassed those two plans and it didn't look anything like those plans at all. So why staff approve those, it, it's, it's very confusing what's going on at the city there. Um, they have made some concessions. We like the single loaded street. If there's gonna be a single loaded street, we prefer the cul-de-sacs and the single loaded street that is approved in the plan. And I'd like to talk to uh, Adam Tarr and his picture at the picnic table on the, the prairie. You know what you're gonna see when you look across those, those beautiful prairies that we planted? You're gonna see houses. You. Thank you. Welcome, Tom, followed by Bobby. Thank you, Mary Teak. Um, first of all, I wanna say I appreciate the time limit and I thank you for it. Um, I think it's an expedient use of time. You, you, uh, you hear sentiment and I appreciate that. I'm here to encourage the approval of this development. I spoke at the last PNC meeting, uh, did the similar uh, it's a needed addition of single family houses and the assisted living facility, which is um, sorely needed in our community. Uh, this does comply with the comprehensive plan. You've no doubt read it and understand that. Uh, you've, you've seen that and it, uh, if you overlay the, the development with the comprehensive plan, you'll see it's, uh, it's right in line with that. It's not unusual, as you know, uh, Terry spoke of that, um, of the process, it's not unusual for a plan to be rejected at PNZ uh, on occasion and then approved. And this was approved by a six to one vote. So I would encourage you to approve it. Um, Iowa City needs it uh, and appreciate that. Lastly, this is not related to this, but um, uh, yeah, Jeff Bruin is a, I, I am. Uh, Jeff Bruin's an asset uh, to the community and I just wanna voice my support. Um, and the previous comments were unfounded and uh, are unfortunate. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Um, welcome, Bobby, followed by Annie. Can you hear me? Yes, welcome. Great, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council. 
Uh, so much of what I wanted to say uh, has already been said, so I'll just reiterate quickly some points I think are important. Uh, there's an unprecedented demand for housing, uh, not just in Iowa City, but all across the United States. And in fact, I think one of the, uh, uh, a woman spoke in uh, public comment about her frustration from going from a renter to a home buyer, and that's because uh, they're flying so fast because there's not enough supply, which is driving the prices up even higher. I think this project uh, provides a lot of single family housing, but also multifamily with the uh, assisted living, which I think is also much needed for our aging population in Iowa City. Uh, this plan, uh, I think, was the uh, developer and his team listened to the concerns that were raised by friends of Hickory Hill, the neighbors of Hickory Hill, the city of Iowa City, as well as the residents who love the park. And I think they've come back with a really responsible, respectful plan that listened to the concerns. Uh, the plan meets uh, the North District, the Northeast District plan, the comprehensive plan, the Bluffwood neighbor plan, by providing that conservation neighborhood design and that residential buffer between the existing park and the development. Uh, it's located by uh, Regina City High. Uh, there's shopping in the Old Town Village, hy V, Drug Town. Those are all great amenities for this new development and the people that will live there. Uh, something I really like is that this new development does not take any land from the existing park, but in fact adds 14 acres to the park, which is a real gift, I think, to the city and to the park. And those two uh, trails that were mentioned that are illegal now through ACT's private land will be incorporated into the park with new trailheads which will make uh, the public much more comfortable using them and they'll be safer. Uh, finally, the uh, city's comprehensive plan allows for this to be rezoned as RS5, so that's not a concern. And as one of the uh, members on the planning and zoning uh, said at one of their meetings, don't let perfect get in the way of good. Uh, I think that uh, should be really taken to heart for this project, as all projects. There's no perfect project ever, but this one is a very good project, and I encourage you to uh, approve it. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And we do have a few more hands raised. I'm going to actually change our time to two minutes. I'm going to call on Annie, followed by Taylor. Welcome, Annie. I, um, this time limit is so silly, like, and so laughably representative of how council sees its constituents versus um, business professionals in the community. Um, but I would like to emphasize what the vast majority of other speakers have said during this time, please do not approve this development and prioritize um, affordable housing for people that have had their goods stolen by police the past week. Thanks. Thank you. Welcome, Taylor, followed by Mohammed. Hello. First of all, it's really great that I get a whole minute less than everyone else, and everyone else already did not get that much time. I wasn't going to talk at all, but you made us listen to the developers for so long. I'm going to waste your time a little bit. I can't really sum up the issues with this plan better than people already have, but I oppose it because we need more multifamily housing. Um, I want to talk a little bit about my experience as a student uh, getting housing in this city. And I'm going to try not to cry on this Zoom call. I was a, a freshman in the dorms and uh, they kick you out 24 hours after your last final. And I am extremely fortunate. I am about the most financially fortunate that I think is like typical here in that the my parents are well off and I had money behind me and I had a place to go that summer before my lease kicked in in August. And I didn't have to worry about buying groceries or paying rent, but that was the most traumatic few months of my life because my home was not safe. But I did not have a place to go even though I had an apartment because in this city, we have homeless week or homeless month, a time where people 
are told by the city and by the university to couch surf, whose couches are we supposed to surf on? All of our peers are also in the same situation. And once again, I am lucky because I had a house to go to. I've heard of other people, it's not my right to speak to their experiences, so I won't go into detail, but people who did not have a place to go, who slept in their car or considered sleeping in their car, I know that there are worse stories that have not reached me, and this is not prioritized. We can't let perfect get in the way of the good. This is not good. <laughs> it is unlivable here for students and for low income people, and it drives people out of the city. It drives young people out of the city. It drives students out of the city. It drives working class people out of the city. It is very clear who this council cares about, and it is very upsetting that I only had two minutes to talk about it. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, Mohammed, followed by Adam. Hi, thank you very much for recognizing me again, uh, Mayor Teague. Just wanted to say that, yeah, I attended one of the listening sessions uh, as well on on this item a few months ago. And yeah, there were so many people in there that, it's, that it spoke. And I had said something in there because it was stated that there wouldn't be a massive problem with traffic or anything in terms of safety. And I spoke about how just in my time running cross country at City High, we ran in this area a lot and there's this team is 80 plus kids and there's also a girls cross country team in the area there's regina's teams as well so there's many kids running in the area for one and when we talk about traffic i just feel it's very dangerous to put something like this there because you have just so many other people actually driving through and then we talk about um, uh, environmental diversity and also just making sure that we actually support our environment if we're ripping out so much land uh, in the area of hickory hill I mean, we can talk about other initiatives we're putting in into place, but when you displace so many environmental aspects in one area, it's very difficult to get the intended, the intended effect elsewhere. So we just really need to ensure that we properly prioritize where exactly we are putting developments, and not only that, but the types of developments we're putting in, such as not just single family homes and single family units, but um, multifamily homes and units. Well, where are the townhouses in Iowa, in Iowa City? Where are the condos in Iowa City? I mean, we look at places like Tiffin and how they're growing and all the neighborhoods of townhouses in North Liberty as well, and the townhouses and condos. And it has made things much more affordable. It has allowed more families to live in, in these areas as well. There are more and more families moving out of the Iowa City area to these other areas due to the decline in, in prices for housing uh, all around there. So once again, just want to parrot what was said earlier about the fact that Iowa City, in terms of metro areas in the state of Iowa, has the highest rental and housing rates, and this is based on data from the Fair Housing Association. Thank you. Welcome, Adam, followed by Tanner. Hello, Mayor Teague and Council. Um, I'll try to be brief uh, as I want to advocate for a great natural space in our community. Um, the Iowa City Comprehensive Plan discourages parks that are surrounded by private property. As deeded over to outlot A, that is exactly what will happen as currently proposed, uh, allowing high, higher income property owners to benefit from the rest of Iowa City residents by allowing their private property to abut a wooded park, allowing private owners long-term financial arbitrage on their property partly paid for, for by, by community members for the generations to come. As Michael mentioned, it is important for the city to, to follow the climate action plan as infill is better than outward expansion. However, density is also important to this concept. The final plan as presented has removed zero lot, um, less expensive housing as were presented in drafts one and two. And higher density buildings could meet climate action goals, additionally allowing more socioeconomic statuses the opportunity to benefit from the proximity of the park. The current proposal does not adequately accomplish this goal in its current form. I appreciate the council listening to hours of community input. I believe the council should reject the plan in its current form. Developers have numerous opportunities to revise drafts of this plan, but the council only has one chance to approve a plan that meets the needs of this sensitive area. Thank you very much. Thank you. And if uh, anyone has already addressed this topic, please lower your hand. Welcome Tanner, followed by Sabri Sky. Hello, thank you, Council. Um, I just want to say, as somebody who is generally very outspoken against this development, I don't personally have as much of a problem with the senior living development. Um, the memory care development will come with its cost to the, the beauty of the park, but there's at least an aspect of utility where it'll serve a large number of people and it keeps some distance from the park while it maximizes that utility. The real problem that I see 
is that it turns the park into the backyard of a few wealthy people, or as a couple of timers, people have referred to them as good neighbors. These houses will not address the issue of affordable housing. And I find it very disingenuous when I hear people suggesting that it will. Um, I would also like to address my disappointment that this is being backed by people such as Joe Clark and ACT CEO Janet Godwin, who have just shown so much contempt for the public through this whole process. It's, it's upsetting. Um, I think they have made it clear that they cannot be trusted to act in the interest of respecting the public. Uh, the Republic has made it, the public has made it overwhelmingly clear over months that we are not okay with this proposal. And I find it very disturbing how the developer was able to just keep submitting, which is basically the same plan over and over until they get what they want. And you can call it a unicorn if you want, but we're not buying it. Hickory Hill Park is one of the most special things about Iowa City. And I implore you to please please protect the, the city's future by protecting the future of this park. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, Sabri Sky. Hello. Uh, I wanted to uh, speak about the need for affordable housing. Just to be one more voice for that. Um, the plan needs to include uh, uh, bus service going near it. Please do not accept this plan unless it is going to be uh, multifamily units and houses that will be there for family homes for people who have a really difficult time getting a mortgage loan. It's a well past time that we have as much as possible more of that in this city, even with something like this, with every single uh, property being you know, $800 for a three bedroom wouldn't be enough. So please do not accept this plan unless that is going to be the cost of rent or any equivalent uh, or less mortgage cost for a, a two bedroom home. I'm tired of hearing that the only possible stewards of the area are people rich enough and privileged and lucky enough to have bought a home when rates were more affordable 27 years ago. I also ran a uh, track in uh, junior high and high school a little bit uh, until I couldn't afford to take two buses to get to school <laughs> to do uh, practice before school. But I appreciate the, those areas and there's absolutely no way that I could afford to get a single family home or even any of the apartments that are being planned with the prices being planned for them because we haven't heard anything about how affordable these are going to be, um, let alone any place else in the city uh, with on top of that, the, the competition for it. Pe people who are respected and given an opportunity to have a roof over their head are stewards of the park as well, of, of all our parks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Welcome, Mila. Myla. Hi, I'm Myla Grady, and I have lived in Iowa City since 1974. I grew up on the south side of Chicago, a very urban and noisy area, and I have lived close to the park for many years. And I want the council to really advocate for this beautiful natural space, a hidden gem that we have in Iowa City. I encourage the council to be visionary. There is no other place to go in this town where you can really experience the peace and quiet of Hickory Hill Park. Um, I treasure the beauty and the quiet of the park. It is truly a gem in this area, so please protect it. The senior living development and the housing development should be presented as two separate applications and voted on separately. And I'm very concerned with the traffic on First Avenue. It's an extremely steep road, a two lane road. The traffic study was completed during a pandemic and I don't think will accurately represent the additional traffic that's going to be um, added to this two lane road. So thank you very much. Thank you. And thanks to all of the individuals from the public that have addressed this topic. We really appreciate the opportunity to hear you. And for council, I am going to ask um, if you are inclined to vote with PNZ recommendation. So I just want to see some nodding of heads of 
one way or the other. Okay, I'm not going to close the public hearing. <laughs> um, Mayor? Yes. I think you'll want to close the public hearing because of the protest aspect of it. If okay. not, then, then folks can, so I, my advice is to close the public hearing. Okay, and then just so that I have clarification, okay. we'll close the public hearing, um, but the majority of council is not inclined to vote with PNZ. We'll have them come and do a, we'll have a meeting with PNZ. Okay, all right. So I'm gonna close the public hearing and I'm going to, I guess, um, we're, could I get a motion to defer? I would be happy to do that motion. Second, Taylor. Moved by uh, Salise, seconded by Taylor. And then roll call, please. Well, I guess we can do council discussion. Discuss, discussing whether to defer or? Well, wait. whatever you wanted to oh. talk about, but certainly I think um, if you wanted to wait until PNZ came, you, you certainly can do whatever you want during this time. Right, that's what I was thinking. I mean, we, uh, it sounds as though most of us would, would like to confer with PNZ on this. Yeah. Any other comments? Roll call, please. Okay, uh, Mims. Yes. Salee? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Weiner? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Motion passes seven to zero. Okay, so uh, can I get a motion to accept correspondence? Move. Sorry. Second. Weiner? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes seven to zero. Nine B, zoning code amendment related to single family site development standards. Ordinance amending title 14, zoning of the Iowa City code related to single family site development standards. This is second consideration and staff has requested epi, um, expedited action. And you're on mute. I know. Give me a second. I evidently closed that language. <laughs> Oops. Thought I had it. Well, I think I'm doing it. I move. I move that uh, the requirement that an item be have two readings uh, be waived, and we condense the two readings. Second, Taylor. Okay, so would anyone from the public like to address this topic? If so, please raise your hand and I will call upon you. Seeing no one, council discussion? Roll call, please. Salee? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Taylor? She's having some yes. issues. Okay. Yep. Uh, I am having issues. Yes, did you hear me that time? Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Okay, thank you. So. Yes. Uh, the mayor is frozen on my screen. I'm not sure. Oh, yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, Thomas? Yes. Weiner? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Mims? Yes. Motion passes seven to zero. Can I get a motion to pass and adopt? So moved. Second. second Thomas. Moved by Mim, seconded by Burgess. All in uh, roll call, please. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Weiner? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Mims? Yes. Silly? Yes. All right, item number 10, cell, um, motion passes seven to zero. Item number 10, cell of 520 North Dodge Street, resolution authorized, authorizing 
conveyance of a single family home located at 520 North Dodd Street. I'm gonna open the public hearing and staff presentation. Welcome, Tracy. Hi, this is Tracy Heishu with Neighborhood Development Services. Um, this is our 69th home of the university program. The, it's a little bit different than our other ones. We propose, well, let me tell you about the background. We, we bought the house for 167,500. We proposed to sell it to, at 227,000. We bought the house as a side-by-side -side duplex and we renovated it and changed the configuration so that it'd be upper and lower with the one bedroom on the main level, uh, an efficiency or studio unit on the upper level with the opportunity for the owner that they could rent for extra income, um, one of the units. It's in neighborhood commercial, so you could also have a ground floor business and live on top of the business. Um, we completely gutted and renovated both units. Um, they both have separate entrances into them. So we had it for sale. We had some difficulty because of the configuration and our reach through our city marketing. So we hired a realtor to help us sell it. Um, we have a buyer that wants to purchase the home. And so, um, pictures of the renovations were in your packet. And if you have any questions, I can answer them about our 69th home. Okay. Doesn't seem like any questions. Thank you. Um, would anyone from the public like to address this topic? If so, please raise your hand. Seeing no one, I'm gonna close the public hearing. Could I get a motion to approve, please? Move, Saleh. Second. 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 Move by Saleh, seconded by Burgess. And council discussion. I'm happy to see this uh, being purchased uh, and improved by staff um, in the process. Uh, you know, this is in a location on Dodge where you're coming into town. So I think it's uh, in addition to all the values associated with the university program. Uh, it will improve, you know, the image and character uh, as one comes into town. It's directly across from Horace Mann Elementary. Uh, so this, this will be a benefit to the surrounding area, as well as uh, those who are entering into Iowa City on Dodge Street. Okay. Um, and roll call, please. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Weiner? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Mims? Yes. Sully? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Motion passed to seven to zero. Item 11, curb ramp 2021. Resolution approving project manual and estimate of cost for the construction of the curb ramp 2021 project, establishing amount of bid security to accompany each bid, directing city clerk to post notice to bidders and fixing time and place for receipt of bids. I'm gonna open up the public hearing and staff presentation. Yes, good evening, Mayor and Council. Scott Sovers, Assistant City Engineer. Uh, so this is one of our city's annual projects that includes installation of pedestrian curb ramps so that where they don't already exist or the replacement of curb ramps that are not ADA compliant. This year's project generally includes installation and or replacement of ramps in the Peninsula neighborhood and portions of the Court Hill subdivision that is located south of Court Street and west of Scott Boulevard. Also included in the project is the replacement of the sidewalk on the east side of Riverside Drive on the McDonald's frontage. The estimated construction cost of the project is $165,000 uh, assuming we uh, receive acceptable bids on June 29th, construction is scheduled to commence late July and finish up mid-October. And that concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions that any of you have. Not hearing any questions. Thank you. All right. Would anyone from the public like to address this topic? If so, please raise your hand. Seeing no one, I'm gonna close the public hearing. Can I get a motion to approve, please? So moved, no. Burgess. Second, Weiner. I'll move by Burgess, seconded by Weiner. And council discussion. 
Well, I'll, I'll bring it up if John's not going to bring it up. Um, in the past, we've talked about it's sort of a different subject, but yet this is important because obviously uh, curb ramps and the ADA requirements are, are important to the city. Uh, but I think in this fall as completion of this, uh, we're gonna be looking at snow removal again. And I think that's something we need to keep in mind about uh, what we can do about uh, helping folks out with snow removal on these curbs after the plow comes through and piles up the snow. Just a little side comment, sorry. I'm excited to see that we're still doing curb ramp um, opportunities for people with disabilities. Uh, we know that Harry Olmstead um, definitely was a big advocate for uh, curb cuts. And so happy to see that we're still committed to doing this work. All right, roll call, please. Thomas. Yes. Weiner. Yes. Fergus. Yes. Mims. Yes. Silly. Yes. Taylor. Yes. Teague. Yes. Motion passes seven to zero. Item number 12, public housing pavement repair. Resolution approving project manual and estimate of cost for the construction of the public housing pavement repair project. Establishing amount of bid security to accompany each bid, directing city clerk to post notice to bidders, and fixing time and place for receipt of bids. I'm going to open up the public hearing and staff presentation. Welcome. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, this is Mari Van Dyke with the Engineering Department. So, this project will repair sidewalk and driveway pavement at 34 public housing units that are owned by the city. Uh, so, as you can see on this map, the units that are in need of repair are located throughout Iowa City, with the majority of them located in the southeastern corner of town. Here are some examples of the types of repairs that are needed. So, essentially, we want to replace any broken, uneven, or cracked uh, sidewalk or driveway panels so that we're eliminating any tripping hazards at these properties. So the schedule would be to open bids June 23rd, award the contract July 6th, and construction would go from the end of July to the end of October. And the estimated construction cost is $147,000. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Not hearing any. Thank you. And would anyone from the public like to address this topic? If so, please raise your hand. Seeing no one, I'm going to close the public hearing. Can I get a motion to approve, please? So moved, Sally. Second, Thomas. Any council discussion? I guess I'm, I, this is coincident. I'm really happy to see that because we were just talking about a public house that's really the driveway is very bad. And, you know, somebody reached out and we've been speaking about it. But, you know, at the same time, the city's already thinking about it, which is great. I, you know, really happy to see that you're taking care of the public housing driveway. Thank you. Roll call, please. Weiner? Yes. Fergus? Yes. Mims? Yes. Sully? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Motion passed to seven to zero. Item 13, park hours. Ordinance amending title 10 entitled public ways and property. Chapter nine entitled parks and recreation regulations to mark park Closure hours uniform. This is second consideration, and staff has requested expedited action. I move that the rule requiring the ordinances must be considered and voted on for passage at two council meetings prior to the meeting at which it is to be finally passed be suspended, that the second consideration vote be waived, and the ordinance be voted on for final passage at this time. Second, Taylor. Uh, moved by Mem, seconded by uh, Salee. And 
public discussion. Anyone like to address this topic? If so, please raise your hand and I'll call upon you. Seeing no one, council discussion. Roll call, please. Burgess. Yes. Mims. Yes. Salee. Yes. Taylor. Yes. Teague. Yes. Thomas. Yes. Weiner. Yes. Motion passes seven to zero. Can I get a motion to pass and adopt? So no. moved, Mims. Second. Moved by Mims, seconded by Salee. Um, roll call, please. Mims. Yes. Salee? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Weiner? Yes. Fergus? Yes. Motion passes seven to zero. Item number 14, Iowa City Area Transit Study Plan and, recommend and Recommended Transit System Changes. Resolution adopting the Iowa City Area Transit Study Plan. And can I get a motion to approve, please? So moved, ma'am. Second, Burger. All right, and welcome, Danielle. Oh, Darian. Hello there. Hello, Mayor, Mayor Pro Hello. Tem, counselors. One moment as I pull up the presentation on my screen. All right, thank you. So, uh, Derry Nagel Gam, Director of Transportation Services. Um, I'm very excited to be with you tonight to present the findings and the uh, recommendations from the Iowa City Area Transit Study. It's been a multi year transit planning process with Orville Transit, the University of Iowa CAM bus, um, transportation services staff, of course, um, a team of transit consultants from Nelson Nygaard and the public culminating in the plan and recommendations that we are presenting in front of you this evening. Just to, to rewind just a bit, because this has been a long uh, and a multi-year process, just to revisit the objectives of the plan. And really we were trying to figure out how we can optimize and improve our current transit system using our existing, existing funding and resources. How can we, how can we reimagine um, our service today? And also we wanted to know what enhancements, what transit enhancements, what transportation enhancements are desired by the community if additional funding is ultimately acquired. So our mission really has been to make transit more dependable for those who rely on it and an easier choice for other people. And a few goals we had with the study was to provide faster, more frequent, more reliable service, to simplify the system, make it easier for people to understand, improve communications and transit stop, um, improve coordination with uh, Corville Transit and CAN bus to make more consistent fare and transfer policies to make it easier to travel across the metro area. And, you know, a lofty goal of doubling ridership over the next 10 years. Um, take it a little bit more of a step back in time just to, to um, remind you of the steps that we've gone through to get to the point where we're at tonight. We launched the study um, in August of 2019, and we started the data collection at that point. We did some pretty significant first couple rounds of public outreach in the fall of 2019. We performed a service and market evaluation as well. Um, we took all of that feedback that we heard from the community in January of 2020, and we presented three alternate service scenarios to the public and um, collect a lot of feedback on what they liked, what they didn't like, and then from March until August, we ultimately worked towards the development of kind of a single proposed transit system redesign. Of course, there was a, a COVID pause in there as well. Um, didn't take all that time, but we certainly needed to um, reshift our efforts towards um, pandemic transit operations for a bit there. Uh, so in the fall of 2020, we presented those study recommendations to the city council at your work session, and we received some preliminary feedback regarding that preferred transit system design and theme the fair recommendations and also the priority of potential transit service enhancements. Fast forward to this year in March, we presented um, some of those potential transit service enhancements to the city council at your work session. And we received direction to pursue a two year 
Sunday service pilot and to come back um, with some more options and more refined options and further explore later evening on-demand um, transportation options. So uh, in April, um, April 29th, we held a virtual public presentation um, to unveil the proposed transit system changes, and we've been collecting um, feedback from the community ever since. So uh, talking about that public input, that public outreach, um, I must say, um, uh, first and foremost, a huge thank you to the community um, over the last two years. We've had over 4,600 points of contact with the community. The bulk of that came in the first three phases, um, and it was not an, you know, one of those easy surveys, tell me what you like, what you don't like. There were, some of these surveys got pretty involved um, and involved um, some, some significant time investment and and some serious consideration of alternatives. And, um, you know, we, we couldn't be more happy to have, uh, to have gotten nearly 4,000 responses. Um, and that's not only online surveys, that's people who came to our meetings, um, that's um, the community stakeholders who we engaged with. Um, so um, onboard surveys, we're, we were thrilled with the amount of um, um, interest um, and dedication the community clearly has towards improving our transit system. The latest phase is really what we've been experiencing since the, the, the final proposals were unveiled in April. And again, we had that virtual presentation. We had 75 attendees um, online on Zoom. We had 139 people simultaneously watching it on YouTube. And then we've had about 100 um, presentation views in the month since the event. We are most excited about um, the, the 240 persons who stopped by our info booth at the interchange the week of the presentation. Um, we just went downtown and brought all of our flyers, all of our information about the proposed routes and the proposed service and just talked to people as they were waiting for the bus or as they got off the bus. And um, we were really excited that so many people wanted to stop by and learn about the new system. We've also done outreach over the last month to community or stakeholder organizations just to make sure they're aware of the changes, give them an opportunity um, to um, provide any comments tonight, um, social legacy media outreach, website updates. Um, we've been distributing flyers with the proposed routes and the proposed service levels throughout the community, um, translated in four additional languages outside of English. And we've received approximately 95 comments um, since the event. Most of those have been an email and those were um, provided to you with your, with your council information for tonight. Um, we did um, we did also include some of the, co the the comments we received at the info booth and the phone calls we received too in the in the comment tracker that I provided to you all this evening. So what do we hear throughout this process from the community? what What are they looking for in their transit system of the future? And first and foremost, and you can see by a wide margin, more frequent bus service. So the community wants more buses on the road, um, less weight in between buses. So that really stood out. Um, Sunday service was the second most requested option. Um, later bus service um, came in third, more reliable on-time information. And I will say that this survey particularly was, was done uh, before we switched from the Bongo app or we introduced the transit app. So um, I hope that that's this, we've already made some improvements on this item. But nevertheless, it's something that everybody in the community clearly wants. Um, that they want to know when the buses are going to get there. Um, Saturday service was another desired improvement. And then faster service, um, more direct routes amongst the other um, items. All right, so just really quickly, just to give you kind of a sense of scale, um, these are all of our routes, current routes stacked ranked by average weekday passengers. And I highlighted the ones um, that have kind of the lowest average weekday um, ridership and then the ones that have the highest. I, I skipped the night routes because the, by nature, um, by, by them traveling only at night, um, of course they would have less ridership. So I highlighted the 7th Avenue Cross Park and Melrose Express. Those are three of the, the routes that we currently have which are, have the least ridership on, uh, on a weekday basis. And then in the evenings, excuse me, on the other end of the scale, uh, in terms of the highest ridership, you see Westwinds, Plainview, the Free Shuttle, and Oakcrest have the highest weekday passengers by route. This is sort of another way to look at the same thing, slightly different. So this is average weekday passengers by 
service hour. Um, so again, at the lower end of the scale, you have Manville Heights, you have the 7th Avenue routes, the East Side Express routes, the Melrose Express routes, or on the lower end of the passenger served per hour. On the higher end, you have Plainview, Towncrest, Oakcrest, and the Breeze Shuttle um, that had the greatest passengers per service score. Okay, so we took all of that ridership information, we took all the feedback we heard from the community, and we developed ultimately three cost-constrained transit service scenarios. That's using our existing funding, our existing buses, our existing staffing. Um, and we designed three different proposals. And again, in January of 2020, we presented those to the public and um, had a lot of um, really great comments about what they liked, what they didn't like, and ultimately, the final proposed route system was based on the public's response to these three alternatives. We worked towards getting you know, as much of the city as we could within a quarter mile of transit, while also increasing bus frequency. That's kind of a benchmark for, for transit um, to try to get within a quarter mile, within a quarter mile. We weren't able to do it everywhere, but that was, that was certainly a goal. And to you know, come to a final transit system redesign um, and, to, and to meet those goals to increase the bus frequency that we heard loud and clear from the public, it really did involve some, some tough decisions and some trade-offs. And we'll talk a little bit more about, about what those were. All right, so here before you, this is the, the um, preferred transit system design based on um, what we heard from the public, based on those guiding principles um, that we discussed. A, a 13 route system is what we're proposing. Um, this would have four routes um, serving the west side, two of them serving the north, um, the peninsula and the north dodge routes would serve the north, six routes serving the east side, and then plus the east side loop, um, which is kind of that dot, those dotted lines you see on the screen. That's really, those are uh, two trips we do per day, one in the school um, AM period and one in the school PM period, although the routes are open to the public. All right, so this section here, I, I just want to walk through, again, some of those things that we heard from the public, uh, kind of loud and clear, and I want to um, show how we address those and, and what we did um, in developing that transit system to address those things. So the first thing that we heard from the public clear, clearly, loud and clear, is more frequent buses, please. So how we addressed that request was to focus our routes on arterial streets with less diversion into local streets um, and, and parking lots to the extent possible. That was really kind of a driving effort is to, to keep them on the arterials and to also create routes that are more out and back, which is really more direct um, and it provides faster service and reduced travel time. The alternative is kind of a circuitous route um, that, that you don't board and you know depart necessarily at the same location it can be a little confusing and it, and it can increase the amount of time people need to spend on the bus so we really tried to go out and back i mean areas where we had routes with very low ridership they were either absorbed into the adjacent routes or service was reallocated to areas of greater need and then in some areas where there was um, duplicative service and that's either iowa city transit providing service kind of on top of iowa city transit routes that sort of um, um, use the same roads for, for lack of a better word, or overlapped each other, but also places where Canbus, Iowa City, and Coralville Transit overlapped. That was the benefit of doing this um, with all of our transit partners um, locally is we could, we did it together so we could see, do we have an excess of service we're putting in certain areas, um, you know, and how do we, how do we more efficiently manage that between our three agencies? Um, what else we heard was we need better Saturday service. So our response has been more bus service on Saturdays. Um, all routes will run um, on Saturdays, approximately 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., except for the East Side Loop, which I mentioned just runs on school days, um, and the Downtown Shuttle, which traditionally has not run on weekends, but all other routes will run on Saturdays, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Um, currently, only six of our routes run on the weekend, um, and they run on a different route than the weekdays which can be um, confusing because you have to sort of memorize two different sets of routes. There's a night and weekend route and then for some of our routes um, and not others. <laughs> and then, then there's a regular weekday route and, and we try to simplify things as much as possible and just make one route that runs um, the same no matter time of day or day of week. 
What else we heard was we want more reliable service. We want the buses to be more on time. So again, we focused our routes on arterial streets with less diversion into local streets and parking lots and that out and back um, philosophy where there's turnarounds maybe at the end of the route, but you really try to maintain the same route um, inbound and outbound and excuse me, inbound and outbound. And all of that allows us to have more wiggle room in our schedule um, to help ensure that the buses are on time. And also we, where it made sense, we consolidated bus stops. So we had some areas where uh, the buses could stop very frequently um, and the bus people waiting at one bus stop could see the next bus stop and could see the, the following bus stop. So we really were strategic about consolidating some of those bus stops that, um, that maybe that would, in order to, consolidating some bus stops in order to, uh, you know, uh, provide faster service on that route and, and reduce travel time on the bus. Uh, we also heard loud and clear, we need Sunday service. So, uh, and, you know, prior conversations at, at work sessions up until this point, but um, beginning in late 2021 or 2022, the Iowa City Transit will begin a two year pilot of Sunday service. Um, the schedule will mirror Saturday service schedule. So they will be a mirror image. Um, and then um, we'll decide how to, the council will decide how to move forward at the end of that. But um, that was welcomed um, by the community. I can tell you, we've gotten lots of positive comments about the Sunday service pilot. Can you sam a simplified transit? So this was um, definitely a theme throughout the, the transit study. So we heard that loud and clear and now all routes will have a name and a number. So you'll be able to refer to a route by, you know, one or two or three. Um, we'll also have on all of our communications, our print communications, they will be color coded um, and we'll integrate that to the extent that we can on the buses as well. But um, we also, again, no more special night and weekend routes. Um, so routes are the same no matter the time of day or the day of week. Um, some other changes um, that aren't necessarily involved with the routes, but all bus passes will be able to be used on Corridor Transit, which is so exciting. And we've heard such great feedback from the community. Every, this is a win. This is one of those rare win-win-wins all around. The drivers are excited. The communities are excited. The passengers are excited. Um, and it will just, it will be a much more simple and seamless process for people to travel across the metro area. Another um, big change um, for Iowa City Transit is that transfers are going to be allowed at any bus stop. And currently transfers are only allowed at the interchange, which is helpful perhaps if you're, if you're transferring to another route to get across town, but what if you wanna transfer, what if you wanna go to a different destination on the same side of town? Before you would have to go all the way down to the transit interchange and then come all the way back. Well, now transfers are gonna be allowed at any bus stop, which, um, is a huge time saver for the public um, and it allows us to use uh, for our transit system to just have so much more flexibility. So we're really excited about this change. It will make things so much simpler. This is one of the, um, probably one of the number one conflicts that happens at the fare box is, is we have to tell people the transfers aren't allowed um, at any bus stop today. So we're really excited for this as well. Free transfers to Corable Transit um, and CAN bus. CAN bus is always free and open to the public, but there, of course, will be free transfers to Corable Transit. And then the transit app, um, it, you no longer need to memorize the bus routes and schedules. You can literally open an in app if you have a smartphone and type in the location of where you are or where you're going, and it will tell you um, the route to take, when you should leave to get there, how far of a walk um, you, should, you should take. It really makes transit so much easier. You no longer have to have everything memorized. So we're really going to be doing a lot of training this summer on, um, on using the transit app, especially in light of all of these changes. All right, we also heard we need more late evening transportation options. So here's what we were able to do um, with, with the transit service. So six, the proposal is that six routes will run until 10 p.m. Two will run till 9.30 p.m. Two will run to 8 or 8.30 p.m. One until 7 and one until 6.30. So we stretched every you know, last dime that we had to pull service later in the evening. Um, and we're gonna have new evening, uh, later evening service to the far east side and to the far west side and to lower Muscatine Kirkwood areas that did not have late evening service before. Now we know there's still needs and we heard from the public there's still needs outside of those, those existing transit hours. And like I said, we stretched the evening service as late as we could with our current funding levels. 
Um, but uh, we are going to be exploring on-demand partnership options to provide late night or overnight service when transit is not in service. Can you make transit more affordable? Um, this is another uh, thing that's been very popular to, to discuss with the public, uh, but those who are 65 and older, uh, those who are uh, disabled, who, um, who apply for the disabled pass, Medicare card holders and seats card holders will ride for free any time of day, which um, is is you know, very popular so far for everybody um, that we've that we've had an opportunity to talk with about this. But especially to any time of day, we do have some passes now that offer discounts. Um, they're discounts; they're not necessarily free, and they are they're time restricted. So you really have to kind of manage what time they're off peak passes. Um, we're getting rid of our off peak restrictions and just making it easy um, for folks um, to travel any time of day. So we're really excited about that. Youth are also going to receive a 50% discount on fare and passes going forward. And we are evaluating a, a low income fare program for the future. All right, so this is just a kind of a summary slide of some of those um, some of those improvements I just mentioned. So again, all buses will run every 30 minutes during the peak times. This is that frequency, that increased bus frequency request we received. All buses will run every 30 minutes during the peak times and two routes will run every 15 or 20 minutes. Today, only six of our 20 routes run um, uh, hourly during peak periods. Or today, excuse me, today six of our routes run hourly during peak periods. So we're really increasing the, the number of routes that um, have high frequency um, service during the peak periods. And not only that, but over half of our routes will now have 30 minute service or less midday. And we definitely heard this from the public. Um, our, tr our transit system today is set up really well um, for you know, maybe a more of a traditional eight to five schedule. And we have a lot of service during those periods, but it really um, makes it difficult to travel midday because you have so long you have to wait between buses. So today only three of our 20 routes have 30 minute service or less midday and over half of the routes um, with the proposal, we'll have 30 minute service or less midday. Uh, we've also improved our evening service. As I just mentioned, we're gonna have our nearly half of our routes running till 10. We'll have a few run till 9.30. We'll have a couple run till 8.30. Then we get seven and 6.30. I mean, we really stretch this in the evening as late as possible. And then we're gonna be going into new areas that we did not have late evening service before. Again, Saturday service, we're going to have all routes will run on Saturdays except the East Side Loop and the Downtown Shuttle, which will be really nice. Um, we have that Sunday service to your pilot coming. And then again, the transfers um, being allowed at any stop, it's going gonna, it's gonna to make a big difference for people, especially who want to travel on the same side of town. I'm just going to open up so many more options. All right, so here, here's the trade-offs. And, and I promised that I, that I would um, talk through some of these earlier, but we, we did revamp our service. This proposal is based on our existing funding and our and the resources really ultimately require trade-offs. Um, so what those trade-offs are, some neighborhoods will have a farther walk to transit. We will have fewer one-seat rides to the university hospitals area. Um, transfers will be required to complete some rides. We did reduce duplicative service in some areas. There are routes that had very low ridership that were absorbed into adjacent routes or the service was reallocated to areas of greater need. And it did require you know, consolidating some bus stops in order to make sure that we can keep the buses on time on these routes. All right, so in terms of some of the non-transit route specific changes uh, to the fares, passes and transfer changes, um, really, we wanted to make the metro area trips easier um, and easier to transfer between systems. We wanted to lessen that financial burden and inconvenience for seniors, those with disabilities, and the youth. So effective um, July 6th, if approved, all passes and single ride tickets, again, will be used on Iowa City Transit and Corville Transit interchangeably. The transfers will be allowed at any bus stop in Iowa City. Again, there's free transfers between Iowa City Corville Transit. The, um, our 65 plus um, seniors, uh, disabled passengers, Medicare card holders, seats card holders will ride for free any time of day. We've got that reduced youth fare um, and um, uh, the school district um, will, who has a, a pass 
previous that they would use that will now, um, they'll get a discounted rate. The school district um, kids will get a discounted rate. They'll get 50% off of their, um, their youth passes. So very positive changes. Um, again, this is all um, a win-win for the community in terms of fair pa passes and transfer changes. All right, so we talked about all the changes that we made with our existing funding, how we kind of move things around and try to reprioritize based on what the community wants today versus what the community wanted when the transit system was originally set up. And these items are the items that the council has been considering that really re would re require um, additional funding. So in the fall of 2020, the council prioritized um, the following potential service enhancements, and that was a Sunday bus service, later evening service, and a night owl overnight service. And in March, um, based on the, the, the scenarios that were presented, um, the council directed staff to plan for a Sunday service to your bus service pilot to commence in late um, 21 or 22, and then to further explore um, on-demand transportation options to kind of fill in that gap after transit service um, wraps up for the evening for late evening and overnight service. All right. Really quickly, battery electric buses. Um, we're really excited about this piece. This was something that we included in the plan and we heard a lot of excitement um, during the virtual public presentation about the electric buses, but um, we're really happy to announce that we've received $3.1 million in federal funding to replace four of our aged diesel buses with um, clean electric buses. 61% um, of the power um, used to to drive these buses will be renewable. It will be mostly wind, so that means reduced carbon emissions, um, cleaner Iowa City, reduced air and noise pollution. Neighborhoods are going to love these. Um, if you have ever stood, if you stand at the interchange, everybody knows when all the buses come in, it can be really loud. You can step five foot off this bus and you do not know it's even running. It is, um, it is whisper quiet um, and the ride is unbelievably nice. So we're thrilled about um, this, um, really huge leap forward for transit service in Iowa City coming this fall. All right, so now to the comments, the public comments we've heard. So as a, these are, this is a summary of the comments we've received since we presented the final um, proposal for transit service changes, the final plan. And just gonna go through these really briefly um, from, they're all stacked rank as you can see. The first um, item on here is the West Side service to the university hospitals and, and, the, and the VA. Um, I have a slide on this, um, which will be my next slide. So we'll talk a little bit about, about this more in detail. And you can see there was a lot of comment. Um, the second item on the list, Sunday service. Um, again, people um, reaching out to support um, Sunday service to, um, to request it, to support the, the pilot. Um, later evening service, um, it's again, people who reached out to let us know about the needs for later evening and overnight service and to um, and to request um, some action be taken to that end. We had a, a few um, comments about fares. I would say all of these are positive and or questions or this a clarification. We did have um, some folks reach out about the Rochester Amherst area. So this would be on the Rochester route. Um, the Rochester route sort of does its turnaround, if you will, on Amherst. It's a north-south street that runs parallel to Scott Boulevard on the east side. And um, the proposal is to shift um, that turnaround area, if you will, over to Scott Boulevard from Amherst. Um, Amherst, I think Scott Boulevard was a, a gravel road when, this, when the transit system was designed. Um, and now it's clearly an arterial built out with a commercial area, um, a, medical clinic, restaurants, all of that. So it seemed to make a lot of sense to shift um, that service over there and provide access to that area. I sh should also note that some of these comments were positive comments, um, people who applauded moving it off of Amherst, and then there were people who, who wished to have that direct service there. We also heard from some folks who, um, who are employees of the University of Iowa Hospitals. They live in the Peninsula area. And um, the way that our route works Today they ride to the interchange and then they they pass on to the hospital. It's kind of a one seat ride to the hospital. Um, the proposal does require that they would um, that they would transfer to another bus. Um, the Iowa City the two Iowa City buses that will serve the hospital um, will be there within three minutes of their arrival. So that's so that's good news. So the transfer time would be minimal, um, and in fact buses should be there. Um, 
by their arrival. So they would be able to get off one bus, hop to another one, but nevertheless, that is a difference uh, for the community. The reason for that is, um, again, that we evaluated really closely places where Iowa City Transit, Orville Transit, and CAM bus service overlap. And that is definitely an area where there is plenty of service and there was, there was kind of a great overlap. So really, in effect, we were sending empty seats over to the hospital um, every single day. Um, between the three agencies, the proposal is this summer, we would have 23 buses go from the interchange to the, the hospital. Nearly all of um, Coralville's buses go and Canvas has got some really significant service um, over there as well. So, um, so anyway, it was, it was sort of right size as to, okay, this doesn't make as much sense for us to carry as much directly over when Canvas, um, which is free and open to the public, has all of this service um, and all of Coralville um, buses or nearly all of them also serve the North Hospital area. A few other areas, um, the Friendship area. Um, so Friendship Street service was, um, I would say, pushed north off of Friendship to Court Street. So that does require a walk for folks on Friendship um, to, to go to the proposed stop areas on Friendship. Manville Heights, um, as another area that um, does not have the proposals to not have direct service uh, for a couple of reasons. One, it was it was very low ridership is, is the biggest reason. And then there was just areas of greater need um, in the community. So that service was reallocated to other places. Seventh Avenue was um, the Seventh Avenue route was also very low ridership, um, but um, there are other routes that were very close um, to Seventh Avenue. So really that route, those riders were sort of um, or that ridership is sort of absorbed into the adjacent routes pretty easily and with um, not a long walk. Well, we received a few bus stop requests. These are just locations that people wanted to maintain a bus stop. Um, we received some questions about the consolidation of routes in the South District with um, Lakeside and, and Broadway routes, um, just general um, questions or concerns about the, either the routes going away or just the walk um, the walk time to the to the new proposed one South Iowa City route. We received a couple um, requests um, or inquiries about um, direct service to Lake Ridge Mobile Home Park, which is actually in the county, but it was served by the sort of in an adjacent way um, by the um, the Westport Plaza route. Caroline Ave area, if you are not familiar with that name, it is um, north of it's off of Prairie du Chien. And there's a loop that has um, gone through that neighborhood um, transit. Yeah, what happened? Yeah, he's, what yeah. happened? Yeah, he's back. Great. I was frozen. Yeah. I apologize. I was frozen for a second. It logged me out. <laughs> All of us was frozen too. I don't know. <laughs> Something okay, went so wrong. It was, it was everybody all at one time. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Okay, great. Well, um, I'm not sure where I'm not sure where where I left off at, but um, the the general comments um, again, we received many positive comments throughout this process. Um, so many thank yous, and just you know, thanks for looking at this, thanks for investing in the transit system. Um, some individual comments, suggestions, that sort of thing. But um, yeah, it was um, it was really nice to just get so many people, even when they're they're offering their constructive comments, to say um, thank you for doing this, and we're, we really appreciative that you're that you're looking at the transit system and you're um, trying to improve it for the future. Okay, so next slide, if I can. So you know what? Sorry here, I think I'm sharing the wrong slide. Just one second, I apologize. Can you all still see my screen? You are not sharing the screen. Okay, I didn't think so. I'm looking for, okay, there we go. Now it's coming back. My screen share option went away. I will share again. Okay, there we go. Not yet. Yeah, okay, yeah. we'll try that again. It kicked me out of my screen share too. But now it's okay. Okay, yeah. perfect. Thank you so much. 
Okay, so as I promised, West Side Service. So since we received the most questions and comments about West Side Service, I thought it would be good to include a slide um, and to, to kind of walk you through what we heard and 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 what our intent was and, and how the service is set up. So first, let me tell you what the concerns were. Most of the concerns, um, the, especially, um, I'd say over the last month, most of the concerns were regarding service start times. Um, so uh, we found out a lot of people on the west side who take transit are, um, they start a shift at seven o'clock at the university hospital. So our, the proposed route time, um, start time um, did not, it would not have gotten them to the university hospitals by, by that, um, by seven o'clock. So we heard that loud and clear and we have, duly noted that and we've made those adjustments on the back end. So um, so everybody on the west side who does need to be at the hospital at seven o'clock, um, you don't need to fear. We are, we're gonna be able to get you um, to, to the hospital on time. So that's the first thing we heard. We did also hear um, some concerns about that there are less routes with direct access to the University of Iowa hospitals and the VA. And then you know generally that there's just a further walk to transit. Um, and, and I would say both of those are accurate, however, there's, there might be some features of the system that can be utilized, um, and I'll walk you through um, what those are. So first, let me let me show you the existing routes. So um, on the left side of your screen, you see um, the routes that serve the west side of Iowa City. So we have the Plainview, West Winds, West Side Hospital, Melrose Express, Oak Crest, and Westport Plaza. Um, the uh, Plainview, West Winds, and Oak Crest have the highest ridership on the west side. And currently there's 30 minute service. So buses come every 30 minutes during the peak times. And then during the off peak times, they come every 60 minutes. Um, the least productive routes in terms of ridership are the West Side Hospital, Melrose Express and Westport Plaza. Um, and those have 60 minute service. So every 60 minutes, um, the buses, um, no matter if it's peak time or off peak, the, the buses come by every six, 60 minutes. Um, one thing we definitely um, could uh, tell, you know, when we were, when we were really starting to dig into things, we do have a lot of routes that overlap in some areas on the west side. Um, so fast forward over to the right and looking at the proposed routes, we have um, four proposed routes, probably really three. Um, I'll, we'll talk about South Gilbert here. South Gilbert's down in the, in the lower right hand corner, mainly three routes. So we have Oak Crest, the eight Oak Crest, the 10 West Iowa City, which is in orange, the Oak Crest is in green, uh, excuse me, the Oak Crest is in red, um, the 10 West Iowa City is in orange, the 12 Highway 1 is in green, um, and the South Gilbert is served, you can see a small gray um, loop at the bottom of the screen uh, that was cut off, that, that is kind of a direct service that's provided on Gilbert Street. So our goals on the west side was to maintain service and, and adequate capacity, passenger capacity, to the north hospital and the south hospital areas. So you see um, near the hospital, uh, University Hospital, near where it says University Heights, you can see that the 10 West Iowa City provides that north hospital access, and then the Oak Crest provides that south um, hospital campus access. Um, another big change, and it's something that we were really trying to do because we heard from the public that this is something that they really wanted and needed, was uh, we wanted to establish direct service between um, the west side and the Highway 1 commercial area. If you look at the existing routes, you can see, um, you could probably see, maybe make out where that, uh, where the Walmart commercial area loop is at, and you can see there's no way to really get there by transit. Um, so part of the design of the Highway 1 route um, was to specifically make sure if folks, um, especially in the, in the Pheasant Ridge area, the multifamily areas on the west side of Iowa City can use transit to get to the Highway 1 commercial areas. So those were two big objectives on the west side. We also wanted to reduce overlapping routes, increase frequency of buses, um, because again, that's what we heard loud and clear from the public, and we were able to do that with this, with this proposal. The 8 Oak Crest route um, will have some of the highest frequency in, in the city, um, really. So it's gonna be, the Oak Crest is proposed to come every 15 minutes during the peak period and during every 30 minutes off peak, which is really uh, incredible um, amount of service. And then the, the 10 West Iowa City, would, um, which is in orange, this would uh, bring buses um, by every 30 minutes during the peak period and 30 minutes during the off peak period. Um, currently, um, most of the service in this um, neighborhood is um, 60 minutes off peak. So 
that is a big improvement. Um, and then the, the other thing I want to mention is allowing, again, it's allowing that transfers at any stop. So we've all, everybody who rides a transit in Iowa City is accustomed to, okay, you're going to a destination, you have to look for the route that goes directly to that destination because you, there's no transfer options um, between routes unless you're going across um, cross town and you happen to be transferring at the interchange. But by allowing transfers at any stop, this um, 12, um, 12 uh, Highway 1 route, this route in green, although it does not directly serve, say, the university hospitals and the VA campus, it, it can be an intermediary route to help get you to a route that gets you where you want to go. So again, you could transfer anywhere along Sunset or Benton, that's shown in green, you could transfer to West Iowa City, you can transfer to Oak Crest, and that is a feature of the proposed system that we do not have today. So um, it just allows some more flexibility with our system. Can I ask a question here? Sure. Can you give me a scenario, for example, I live here in Feather Ridge. Uh, you don't see me where I'm pointing, but you can point that. And two people ride the bus, one of them going to the hospital, one of them going to Highway 1. Could you walk me what they can do? Yes, get... so if, if somebody was on Highway 1, let's say somebody boarded at um, Highway 1, they were on the Highway 1 route, let's just say they boarded. Um, I... No, no, I mean like both of them live in Pheasant Ridge. Mm -hmm. And both of them take the bus, one of them going to the hospital, and the other one going to Highway 1. Yes, they would. Okay, so one would, if they both live in Pheasant Ridge, then the then the person who wanted to head to the to the Highway One commercial area would take uh -huh. the twelve Highway One route in green, and the person who wanted to go to the hospital area would take the orange route, which is the ten West Iowa City. But they and would have both both routes do run past um, the Pheasant Ridge area. Okay, get here. That's what I want to see. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, and they're they're kind of overlapping here, so you can't really see that but underneath the screen section it is uh, orange and it is uh, shows that the 10 route also the west iowa city route also goes by pleasant ridge okay yeah okay yeah i can see that by west high yeah okay thank you all right so next step so um late june early july we're, the plan is to finalize and publish the bus schedules and continue the marketing and information campaign we've had to educate the public on the transit system changes you know, we're going to have the info booths fired up again. There's probably going to be some cold, sweet treats because um, it's going to be in the in the heat of summer um, to stop by. Uh, we're going to do some training on the transit app. There's going to be a lot of um, public outreach um, to our media, through our social media, through our legacy media, um, and just general outreach to community and stakeholder organizations. Upon approval, we would launch the fair and transfer policy changes um, in alignment with Corville Transit on July 6th. So that's the first day after the July 4th holiday. Um, the, the, the intent was to launch those a little bit earlier um, because they're a, easier to transition to um, and just you know make things a little bit simpler when, when the big change comes on August 2nd, when we plan to launch the new routes, stops, and the new bus schedule. But that's not all. That is just the first phase. So, um, you know, in terms of what's next, we will be launching the battery electric buses this fall, which we're really excited about. We will have the two year pilot Sunday service um, coming late in this year or early next year. We'll be again digging into the late night, overnight, on demand service options, what we can do to help um, boost that access to transportation. We have uh, plans to start improving our bus stops holistically um, across the community. We're really excited about that. We're working on community, uh, improving our communication tools. We're working on improving our ticket availability, um, making it easier to get transit passes, um, whether that's vending options or more partners um, downtown. Um, we're evaluating a mobile ticketing option for smartphones. That's another um, thing that a lot of communities are doing um, now. And then last but not least, evaluating options for potential low income programs. So we've got our work cut out for us, um, but, but we're really excited about all of the proposed changes. So um, just thank you um, for your time. And I just wanted to open it up to any questions. I'd be happy to answer any. Can you, can you go back again to the West side? Because we really had a lot of questions from the West side. Sure, yes, we did. Uh, you know, for example, I don't know, 
you cannot see where I'm pointing, but for example, like far away on the orange line, like far away from, from West High. Yep. I, I can't even, yeah, not Melrose, like going, going west. Okay. For example, if two people, another scenario, if two people like really far west on the orange line, they took the orange line here because there is no another trans, you know, service here but the orange line. And they going, one of them say, I'm gonna give you the same scenario. One of them wanna take the green and the other one going to, to continue on the orange one to go to the hospital. Uh, when they get to that, that means they have to execute here some, some kind of by Pheasant Ridge or some mm -hmm. like mirrors or yeah, mirrors to execute to the green. How long are they supposed to stay for the execute? Do you think like when they get off a mirror so they can take the green line, how long that person will stay there? waiting so, for the green light yep great question so we don't have the the bus schedules finalized yet but i so i can't give you a definitive answer but i i would uh, we are we're trying to minimize the transfer time or the the dwelling time at these transfer points um i i can't tell you uh for sure i would say 10 minutes or less potentially it's just it's um, we'll be able to tell you that for sure once the schedules are finalized and published but yes, they will have your ear correct that they will be able to, um, you know, exit the 10 route um, along uh, Mormon Trek, and then they'd be able to pick up the 12 um, Highway 1 route um, along along Mormon Trek. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mormon Trek. I said Melrose. Yeah, Mormon Trek. Okay. So I have one question oh, also yeah. about the West. Councilor Weiner. Um, sorry, I have one more question about the west side. Sort of, do we do we know um, if, for example, Canvas after when they serve the parking lots that are that are out in the Hawkeye Court area, if they then come up to Melrose and turn and turn left to go into town? Because I'm just sort of trying to think of an alternative for some of the folks on. The west side who live sort of out in, in the in the area that won't it won't be served they didn't have a lot of ridership but also won't be served anymore by the by the current melrose express um and thinking that if if campus comes up there to melrose and then heads into town that might be an alternative Nope, that's a, that's a great question so yes campus does run service um um, in a clockwise loop um, north from the Hawkeye lot um, through Mormon Trek to Highway 6 to the hospital area and then comes back along along Melrose. And I do know, I don't know where their stops, if they have stops located along Melrose, that would be something I'd have to look into. But I do know that they have um, a, a tremendous amount of service that goes to the Hawkeye lot um, um, in the mornings. I mean, I think my understanding is that buses come by uh, about every five minutes during the peak times. Um, so there is, um, there's quite a bit of service that CAN bus provides to the hospital area from, from the Hawk, um, from the Hawk lot. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Darian, this is John. Do we, do we know where the electric buses will be deployed? We do not yet. I can tell you for certain they will not go, um, they will not be deployed on any route that involves the railroad bridge um, on Iowa Avenue. Um, we did we did take a test run and we had uh, uh, someone from Proterra drive the bus um, for, for liability purposes, they would, they would only allow us to do it. And it was a, it was a scooter. Um, so um, we're, the buses are taller than our buses right now. Um, they are, it, reasonable height to get into our bus facility, but they're not, um, they're not, um, we're not able to get them underneath that railroad bridge in a way that we could do on regular service days. So virtually it could be any route. Um, we don't really assign our buses to routes specifically. Um, they kind of get uh, new assignments every day, if you will. So I would suspect we would see them all over the community, except for where that railroad bridge is at okay, for now until they come out with shorter buses, which we're, we're which are already pushing them for. 
So Darian, uh, sorry to elaborate on this, but back to the west side routes. And thank you for answering my question about that and showing the comparison slides, because we did get a lot of uh, questions, uh, emails from folks in that area, primarily heading to work at the hospital, either UIHC or the VA. Uh, and now these folks in healthcare, all, all persons going to work need to be on time, but it's particularly important for healthcare folks. Uh, and they normally have to be there even before seven so that they can uh, change into scrubs or whatever they need to do. Uh, is this, are these routes going to allow them to be able to get to work in a timely manner? Uh, or I don't know if you can estimate that or not. Yes, um, so the, the original proposal would not have um, gotten them to work on time, um, but we did um, after, you know, we saw a <laughs> critical mass of uh, people that are, are transit users that, that are seven o'clock shifters out in that area. Uh, we click, quickly realized that, um, that we would we need to go back to the drawing board and look at that start time for that, um, for that, um, for that route. So we do have a plan in place so that we will be able to get um, folks who work at seven o'clock at the hospital um, to the hospital um, in plenty of time um, riding the 10 West Iowa City route. Thank you. I have a few different questions in, in no particular order. Um, one is about ridership. And so you uh, highlighted those top ridership routes, one of which is the free shuttle. Do you have a sense as to um, when you're balancing the different factors that would make a, a, a particular route a high ridership route, obviously, you know, population density there, um, the route itself and where it's going. And for that one, the, the free fare, um, and when we're looking at wanting to double ridership, do you have a sense of kind of how those different factors come into play? I realize that's a very open-ended question, but. Um, I love open-ended questions. Um, so no, that is, I think that is a major factor. Um, it just, and it's not even just the dollar, it's just eliminating another thing that you have to do. Um, you don't have to worry about a pass. You don't have to stop at the fare box. Um, your trips are, are easier and and yeah, so getting to a, to a place where we can legitimately double our ridership, I mean, I think that's that's something to seriously consider for the future. I know we had other priorities and and our and the first priority um, priorities that you all laid out was really directed to let's improve the service first and foremost. And um, but ultimately, um, if we, if you know if we if we really want to get to that doubling of ridership, that is certainly something to evaluate um, for the future. So going off of that, when we started this process, when you started this process, it was before the pandemic. And since then, I think uh, our transit system has received a fair amount of relief funds. Does that influence um, decisions that you're making here or what you might recommend for the near future? Well, some of the, so there's been a couple different sources of relief funds, but some of the, um, the at least the relief funds that have um, flow directly to transit have been um, accounted for in terms of the Sunday service pilot and um, the, the, the proposed um, and not yet realized plan for kind of an on-demand late night, late evening. So some of that has um, definitely been earmarked for those. Um, we have also, you know, we, our ridership is about at 50% um, and we took a big hit in the early stages of the pandemic, as you might imagine. So we've been um, using those emergency funds to help backfill and support, um, keep keep the bosses on the road, keep um, keep um, you know uh, the paychecks flowing to, to the staff, um, um, you know the things that we need to do to keep the transit system running. So, but um, you know that is that is certainly one that is certainly one creative way that emergency relief funded could be evaluated is to you know find a way to potentially either reduce fares for a, a subset of the population or potentially, you know, work towards um, a fare free system. Those are all those are all ideas and concepts, I think, that, that could be evaluated with the level of funding, the emergency funding that um, completely was not really expected. We're really grateful to have it and we've been able to maintain operations. But um, yeah, there's more possibilities now than we maybe had before the pandemic for such a move. Great, thank you. And then my last question, another open ended one. Um, with the tremendous amount of public engagement that you've gotten through this process and a lot of the input coming 
I think you were highlighting a lot of the input, especially that's been coming recently, right? Like you said, you had a lot at the beginning as well, but then in this last month or so, um, some of those specific comments, which were also in our packet. So with this um, significant changes, if we approve this tonight, do you have a plan for kind of continuing to assess and collect data and know if additional adjustments need to be made and that kind of thing? Yeah, absolutely. So um, that's, we're already working through uh, what our what our new reporting will need to be so that we can accurately and uh, timely monitor how this system is performing. So we're going to be we're going to be monitoring our ridership. Um, we're going to be monitoring um, on a weekly, monthly basis um, just to see how everything is shaking out. And and I don't suspect that these are you know the only changes we will make for another 30 years. It's been a long time since we made big changes. You really should kind of take a hard look at things, I think every five years really, um, but but having a, a good program to monitor, um, monitor in between whether that's what we're hearing from the community, what we're seeing in the ridership and, and um, you know, make adjustments or offer adjustments as, as we see fit. Um, like I said, I think we should, we should kind of do a rehash every five years just to, you know, check and see what, where can we, the community changes so much every five years in Iowa City. So it's really, I think it's really important that we keep, um, keep tabs on that and keep monitoring that. And we will. Great. And do you think public engagement will continue throughout that process? There's, will there be opportunities for the public to continue to give feedback? Always. Um, we are always, we are always um, welcome public feedback um, as a general rule. But yeah, I think it's it's really helpful when you create a platform for the public to reach back out to you. So clearly when we went to the public, we went to the public in such a way that they responded with a tsunami of um, feedback, which was fantastic. And I think as long as we position, you know, our questions well, <laughs> you know, if we have specific questions, um, we get really great feedback in advance. So, you know, as opposed to the five point survey, it's like, how do you like transit? How is it working? You know, getting really specific seems to work um, really well and engage the community. And we get, um, we get the information we need to make the changes that we need to, to reflect the community desires. Thank you. Yeah, I really want to also like a second what uh, Klaus Berger said about yeah, hopefully after even we pass this, we continue the conversation about, you know, like uh, feedback from the public, uh, because I really hate it to uh, approve it today. And after that, find out the West Side people who work at the hospital, they cannot find like really, they are not going there on time. I know a lot of people who work there, you know, as the hospitals and they take, uh, you know, the, the bus normally. And because you know that it's very expensive to work at the hospital. You know, I used to work there, I used to study there, and I, I, I used to live in the West Side too. You know, at that time, even I have to go and figure out where I can find the university pass so I can take it. But this is really, uh, we start seeing increasing people who live in the West Side, uh, you know, work at the hospitals, whether it's like kitchens or technicians or, you know, janitors, but they need to go there early. Uh, and, you know, yeah. there is shift for the hospitals really seven o'clock. I hope, you know, uh, even though this is not clear yet and you don't you don't have a clear plan yet for those and what you're going to do, but I want to see that you satisfy and make those people comfortable taking the bus. Any other questions <laughs> from council? All right, we're gonna hear from the public. If anyone wants to address this topic, please raise your hand and I'll call upon you. I'm gonna call Mike, followed by Jeremy. And we are allowing everyone three minutes. And we can hear you. Um, your mic is on mute. There we go. Thank you Great. very much. Um, and thank you, Darian, uh, and everybody else associated with uh, uh, this study. Uh, Mike Carberry here, and I've been a longtime member uh, of the Community Transportation Committee. Not only am I a climate geek, but I've been a transit geek all my life. I think that our transit system um, can solve a couple problems that we have here. 
in the community. And one of them is the ongoing climate crisis that we have. And the other is the growing number of working poor that we have in our community, as maybe we have heard earlier today uh, in this meeting. And I think uh, this plan addresses a little bit of that, but it may not have gone far enough in my opinion. Uh, I love seeing electric buses, uh, four is great, but I think we need to move to all, uh, all electric fleet as fast as we can. Uh, you want a double ridership, that's wonderful. The best way to do that is to make the bus free. And then everybody can reduce their carbon footprint, but most of all, our working poor has a free way to work. So they are really wanting to get on the bus because they can save probably hundreds of dollars a month by not using their car. Um, so a couple other things here uh, on the routes. I grew up in Manville Heights. Uh, Manville Heights has no service and most of the people will have to walk a mile at least the people in Manville Heights and Mosquito Flats. The closest bus stop will be at Park Road in, uh, North Dubuque Street or over on Newton Road. Uh, that's a long walk for my mother who is 89 years old. So for climate reasons, uh, those fares uh, we, you know, right now, obviously free fares for elderly, for people that are disabled, uh, that's wonderful. And also a 50% fares for youth. But, what we really need to do is to address the working poor situation. We would love to see a pilot program as soon as possible on reduced fares for people that are of, uh, of lesser means. And we also, they need that late night service and that overnight service because a lot of the jobs for the working poor are really at those odd hours and overnight. So if we're gonna do pilot programs, I would love to see us get pilot programs for that late night and overnight service as well. So uh, again, I thank everybody for working on this. I'd like to thank the bus drivers and the mechanics and everybody else that works on our transit system here. They've done a, a, a yeoman's job here during the pandemic and I'd like to thank them. I'd like to thank the city council for having the fortitude and the, um, the foresight to uh, go through this with this transit study. And with that, I'll conclude my remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, Jeremy, followed by Rachel. And you're on mute, Jeremy. Welcome, Jeremy. We can hear Jeremy. Let's go to Rachel followed by David. We'll come back to Jeremy, please. Hello, this is Rachel. Thank you so much for having this meeting. Um, first, I'd like to answer a question that was asked earlier. The CAN bus system does not stop on Melrose Avenue at all. So that doesn't really provide a viable transport option for those of us who live on the west side like myself. Um, in the second place, I agree with some of the comments made earlier that without transit schedules, it's hard for me to know exactly how I'll get to work. Like I said, I'm a resident of the west side. My route will probably involve transfers, which I don't mind, except that I don't know uh, what my commute will look like. Will it look like 30 minutes? Will it look like 45? It's currently 12 to 15, so that's quite a difference for me. Um, so yeah, I have trouble seeing why we should approve a plan without these proposed schedules, which will really re let residents know how this will affect their daily lives. So I'm actually all for the changes in the transit system, but I need more information before I can personally endorse anything. And I'd ask you to consider that tonight. Thank you. Thank you. We're gonna try Jeremy again before we go to David. Welcome, Jeremy. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you so much, uh, everyone that's worked on this. Um, it's exciting. Um, transit service is a huge help to people looking for employment, especially after COVID. Um, and so we'd like to ask that SNAP and Medicare cardholders uh, be able to ride for free um, along with um, Medicaid. Um, it seems unclear why there's a distinction um, between Medicare and Medicaid. Let's just let everyone ride for free that who, who really needs the service. Um, and we think that 
uh, late night transit service makes sense for us, our city. It has a vibrant nightlife um, and 24 hour manufacturing. And so we're asking for um, service until midnight um, and a permanent ongoing um, on-demand service after hours. Um, and we'd like to, we'd like to see uh, second shift workers uh, get home safely. Um, there is a, uh, it is a public safety concern. Um, we've talked to uh, people at the farmer's market, um, say they get off work. They're restaurant workers late at night. Um, some of them get followed home um, and harassed on the street. So, you know, being just on foot going home in the middle of the night is not safe. So we'd like that to be addressed. Thank you, Jeremy. Welcome, David, followed by Dan. And Dan, uh, David, looks like your hand went down. So we'll welcome Dan, followed by David. I see the hand went back up. Welcome, Dan. Hi, um, I would just like to back up everything that Mike said. Um, I think the bus fares should be free. Um, I know that folks who live and work along the CAM bus routes, that's something that they really utilize and it's really good for a lot of people along those routes. Um, and I think that if the citywide or even citywide in regards to both Iowa City, Coralville, um, and maybe even with Liberty, I think if there is free fare, that would um, not only be better for individuals, but um, people would be, um, uh, would be using the buses, not using their cars. It would reduce emissions. It would be much better for, for the environment. And it would uh, increase ridership and I think just kind of help uh, unite the community. I mean, because I think it's kind of, I it's a weird thing, but I think that if like folks use communal transit like that, it, it really, really brings folks together. Um, I'd also like to say that I think 24 bu hour bus service would be great, um, both in regards to nightlife and those who work around the clock. I think that is a great service for um, everybody involved. Um, if the council insists on, uh, and also, um, I think, like I said, every, everything should be free, but if the council insists on keeping, uh, making people pay, they should expand payment options. I know it was said that folks could pay with um, their phone, but I, I, I don't believe that people can pay with a card to get to ride the buses, like a debit or a credit card. And I think that for some people who are kind of in a tight spot when they need to take the bus, but they don't have any other way to pay, it's kind of an awkward situation for them. Um, and I guess in regards to going back to Hickory Hill, someone said that Jeff Fruin is a great manager and an asset to the community. And I would just like to call bullshit on that. So thank you. Thank you, Dan. Welcome, David, followed by Sabri Sky. Uh, hi, thank you. I actually lowered my hand earlier just because I thought it was what I should do when my turn starts. Um, uh, yeah, uh, first thing I want to do is say, like, uh, I worked in the parking transportation department, and uh, most of the people I worked with were really excited about Darian Nagel Gan taking up the head of the department. Um, uh, I, I like to believe that this is a pretty good show, uh, that they were totally right. Um, really proud that our city is uh, going through with this. Um, I also share concerns about the plan not including uh, the route schedule being part of it. Um, I like to believe that perhaps there's a way that we could pass this resolution with um, some manner of uh, a definite timeline to allow public input specifically for how those routes would go. Um, I'd also uh, like to uh, echo something that uh, Darian Nagelman said about um, the limitations of the budget affecting this plan. Um, uh, last summer, it came to light among the general population that the uh, Iowa City Police Department has uh, about $8 million um, in non-labor uh, budget funding. And uh, it feels like since we could effectively double the transportation department's budget by just taking off one eighth of that, um, and we just demonstrated that we can spend that money on tanks, uh, 
you know, it, it feels like we should really empower our transportation department to um, make a budget request. Um, you know, if we could have some sort of civilian list listening posts for how money can be reallocated. That, that feel, seems like one of the biggest uh, criticisms of the protests that we hear is um, that an actual plan is never proposed, but uh, it, it seems like having listening posts for route and budget decisions on this would really, really help um, instill some civilian confidence in this. Uh, and uh, as someone who currently works in the water billing department, I, I want to suggest that we already have a, a, a program for uh, certifying that low-income individuals are um, receiving SNAP and um, Medicare slash Medicaid benefits. I think it would be really um, smart of the city to try to uh, bridge that program with transportation so that we can reduce the amount of work that's duplicated. Um, I also support the buses just being free, but uh, you know, I'm. Uh, <laughs> I, that's a whole topic that I'm not prepared to go into. Um, anyway, uh, if, if there's any sort of light these days, it's definitely the work we're trying to do on the transportation department. Um, I love the buses. Uh, this is pretty solid so far. Oh, uh, I worked at Little Caesars and got off at midnight all the time, and it sucked. And everybody on the south side needs more service at night, uh, especially overnight. Bye. Thank you, David. Welcome to Bree Sky. Hello. Uh, Hello. Thank you. Uh, thank you. This is Sabri, and I just started uh, volunteering with uh, Community Transportation Committee uh, more officially. And I want to first thank Darren Eaglegam and the, and the Transit Department for, for putting this together and doing all this work and the, the, with the uh, Iowa City Area Transit Study. And it's really great to see such progress. Um, and well, what has been taken into consideration. Thank you for uh, clarifying the transfer, uh, the transfers working, but I do want to ask and, and push for both as an individual and uh, with, uh, with CTC that we have the later night service that we get that pilot program started sooner rather than later. Um, some of that is also in the language and in the approach. We've, We've seen listed weekend service, not always just named as Saturday service. And that's something that we need to see fulfilled if it's gonna be called that. And if it's going to be called that now, then we need to have that actual weekend, two days, Saturday and Sunday service of some kind. If it can't be the fixed route buses, uh, then the on-demand uh, partnership, um, I number one, wanna push for that service till midnight at least. I've worked all different hours of the clock or had obligations uh, personally and in doing some outreach, uh, met with people at bus stops who were uh, experienced uh, randomly, so somewhat anecdotally, but, but also collecting this uh, kind of by accident over time and starting with CTC, that people are waiting for the bus after they run and at night um, or waiting for a bus that doesn't come for another 50 minutes, sometimes not knowing when it comes because they don't currently have the app and can't download it without enough data or their phone battery is dead. And we need to take care of people in that most vulnerable situation of working at night or working till late or needing to pick up kids till late or get home till late. I took the bus, the last bus is at 10 or 10.30 as a teenager out of necessity, um, we need to see more frequent evening service. I'm really excited for the more frequent midday service. And I understand that currently there are some trade-offs. If it takes a bigger budget, we need a bigger budget for transit. As Fran Leibowitz says, the mark of a city is its transit system, its public transit system. And while we might not be New York, we were the first uh, UNICEF literary city and we try to be a green city. We're not a walkable city, we need buses that reflect the working hours of people besides the early morning at the hospital. And we do need at least a low, that low income uh, discounted pass. I want to just advocate for it. Thank you, Sabri Sky. Thank you. Would anyone else like to address this topic? Seeing no one, council discussion. Can I just ask Diana again questions about 
like, you know, with, with the urgency of approving this today, since there is many elements is missing, is there is an urgency you have to approve it today? So the, we're asking for approval today um, so that we can stay on track for the, the two kind of milestones that we have, um, the next upcoming milestones, which is to launch the, the fair and transfer policy changes on July 6th, and then to stay on track um, to launch the route changes um, on August 2nd. So um, there's a, a lot of... Um, work that needs to be done between between approval and uh, each of those two steps. So that's why we're bringing it for you tonight. Um, in terms of the bus schedule, which is really the last piece um, to, to be finalized, uh, we do plan to get that out as soon as possible and in plenty of time for, for the community to, um, to absorb, to, um, for us to be able to help um, guide them through the process of understanding how the, they will use the new system for their trips. Um, like I said, we're, we're hoping to have it out in, in late June um, or um, early July and at least a month in advance is, is what we're, is, is our goal. And we have a lot of uh, those bus schedules have to all be individually designed. Um, so we are, we're working through that, that custom process right now. So those are, those are a few of the things that, that we have coming next, but really that's, that's the last piece of the puzzle um, besides uh, council consideration and approval. I and really the public this, outreach. Yeah, thank you. I really add this question because to be, there is many people they haven't had a chance to come on, on the proposal when it was just like an idea, but now you're having everything clear. People start understanding what's going on, how the route is look like. And we start receiving comment from people never come on, on the original proposal. So uh, they didn't even have the survey because some people they just need to look how it look like and how the change will be, uh, you know, rather than just taking a survey and all this. So uh, I really want to see, like, wait until we have more people comment on those and also uh, figure out the pilot route and especially low income people, uh, what you gonna do about that uh, for, for the fair, like free fair or, I don't know how, but I, I guess free fair will be great for low income people. And I, I really wanna see that happening before I approve anything, especially we need more people to look at the current proposal and tell us if that's good for them or not. Uh, thank you, Darian, for all this information. That certainly was large part of our packet this time with all, with all of the uh, information from the uh, consult team and thanks to them for, for doing all that work. Uh, I have to be honest, I was thinking that back when, and I don't wanna speak for you, Mayor Pertam, but uh, back when you and I, which seems like it must've been at least two, almost two years ago when we first, both of us talked a lot about, we really need to take a serious look at our transit system because it's not uh, helping a lot of our folks. Uh, uh, get to uh, where they need to be. It, it, uh, it, it was a barrier. We don't want it to be a barrier or access to their work. Uh, we want it to be helpful and useful for them to get to their jobs and also to fall along lines with our um, uh, climate action goals of uh, decreasing the carbon emissions with the cars out on the road. You know, let's, let's get people to take transit. So I do have uh, some concerns uh, and, and I'm glad Councillor Burgess brought up about will we be able to revisit this because I'm I'm hoping especially with those west side routes because uh, I have concerns about those changes especially for my folks uh, the Cote University Hospital and VA Hospital Hospital uh, I'd like to hear from them once we get going on this my my concern all back to what uh, Mayor. Uh, Pro Tem and I talked about two years ago was our concern was also access to later night, later night service and weekend service. So I'm a little disappointed, although I guess we had approved that, that, that that's going to be at a later date. And I'm hoping it says late fall 2021 into 2022. And I'm hoping that uh, we can do it as soon as possible, even sooner than that, because I think that's where the need is. Because uh, I know I used to work with some folks that uh, they could ride the bus in, but getting off at 1130 or, or midnight, 
they'd have to take a cab home and that got a bit expensive, but there was no other option at that time. Uh, so I think we really do need to look at that, uh, whether it's partner partnering like uh, uh, you talked about, Damien, or SMOP. I, I hope it's sooner than later because that already a couple of years have gone by and we've been talking about this and talking about this. And, and I think uh, that's, that's an important aspect of it is the late night service and the weekend service. Marian, I want to thank you and your staff for all the work. This is in the consulting team. I mean, this is an incredibly complex puzzle, um, essentially. And as you mentioned numerous times, lots of competing and conflicting um, interests. I suppose they wouldn't be competing if we didn't have a limited budget, um, but we do. And so I just really appreciate all the hard work that you've done to, to put this together. And, it, on, and obviously you and your staff and the consulting people have, have worked on a timeline with certain, certain things that need to get accomplished by certain dates so that you can keep things moving forward. And, and I understand the concern that we don't have, you know, the final, um, timelines of each individual route. We know what the routes look like. We have an idea of the headways, whether they're 15 minute or 30 minute, et cetera. And so I would encourage council um, that we go ahead and approve this so staff can continue to meet those timelines and get this implemented. And as we asked earlier, you know, the question, what kinds of adjustments can be made? We want to do so much more. And obviously the comments from the community um, are clear that they want so much more. But as we went through all these presentations, you know, from staff earlier, we did make decisions about what our priorities were and what we were going to move forward with now and what we were going to try and add later on, you know, as, as soon as financially and, and otherwise feasibly possible. So I would encourage us to stick with, you know, kind of what we had told staff we wanted to go forward with at this point. The one thing I did hear tonight that was a little bit different that I would encourage staff to look at is if we do have within the city uh, mechanism already, people who qualify for certain uh, the federal programs that we allow them to use the SNAP program was one that I heard mentioned. Um, quite frankly, just because somebody's on Medicare doesn't mean they need free bus service. But I'm not going to I'm not going to say we shouldn't do that. I'm just saying just because you're 65 and qualify for Medicare does not mean you are in financial need. So if we're going to do it for people on Medicare, if we have the capability within the city technology system now that we could transfer over to transportation to use um, for free bus service for other individuals who we do know are in financial need, I would encourage us to look at that. The other pieces that we know are coming, I would just encourage council and the public to um, have the patience, we'll get there, but let's not, let's not delay this and cause it to delay other steps along the way. We want to get it implemented as quickly as possible. And then obviously we can and may have to go back and look at certain adjustments. I think we just really, I'm sorry, maybe somebody else want to talk, but I, I just believe that even if we move forward with this, we have to give clear direction to the council. We can just say, we hope to see we, you know, we want to see that low-income people, same thing like one earlier mentioned, the low-income for the discount that we have for water, where you give paper, so you take it to the human services and it's time it and the human service send it back to the city. Uh, yes, right now we give clear direction, low-income people who receive any type of human service benefit, whether it's Medicaid, and I'm not talking about Medicare, Medicaid or food stamp or WIC or just kind of like, you know, uh, low income benefit. I think we just say they get the bus for free. We can just give that direction. We don't have to say we hope because we are the one who are making this decision. 
And if that's something we want to see, just give clear direction to the council, to the staff that what we want to see, period. And also, if we want to see that, the people who complain about how long it take them, and you going to do the schedule rather, let us give you direction. Make sure, you know, those people are not waiting for a long time between transfers and, you know, the, the time, just the start time will accommodate everyone, all that. And I don't know, is this you're going to bring it to us back again? Or how after the schedule, how we will know about the schedule? Do we approve the schedule? Or how is this going to work? Or we approve it now and you put any schedule and we have to go with it? I don't believe in the past that the council has uh, considered approval of the schedule. It's, it's my understanding that it's been uh, council purview over the routes themselves. Um, and then the, the schedule and stops were sort of up to the purview of the department, of course, with you know feedback from the community and feedback taken from, from the council. But I, I don't believe um, they were, uh, the bus schedules um, have a formal council approval process. I understand, but we are changing system to make it better, not to make it worse. So if you had the schedule here, and now we're receiving complaint from West Side people that this, you know, if this bus is starting at a certain time, they are not going to be on time for their work. So we would like to make sure you are, we are satisfying the public. We are doing all this because we won't be able to start taking transportations and going to work. That I really encourage then, if that's the case, I encourage the council to wait for next meeting. So, you, you know, you, we hear more feedback from the public uh, if we don't have a power to change the schedule or, I don't know, but. It sounded to me like, like and Darian, please correct me if I'm wrong, that you've already made the adjustments to make sure that the, that the, that the buses will start earlier so that people can get to work on time, that you have heard that piece and are building it into, and are building it into the, into the schedule. Yeah, that, that's correct. So for the west side, um, the 10 West Iowa City route, which clearly did not start early enough for, for the folks that started at 7 a.m. in the hospital, we did um, find a way to, um, to ensure, uh, ensure that folks can get to the hospital by seven o'clock, well in time, uh, well in time of when their, their schedule starts. So that particular problem has been resolved. Um, we figured out a way to make that and it will be reflected on the bus schedules once they're published. And if you receive more uh, feedback from somewhere else, as a side of the city? I would say we'd have to consider the, the number and um, the, the types of feedback and the specific of the situation. I would say on the west side there was a clear pronounced um, uh, critical mass of um, university employees who rode transit and needed to be at work by 7 a.m. And we haven't we haven't heard that from other parts of the city. Not to say that we couldn't, but we would certainly take that into consideration um, if we did. I think it's important that we not micromanage this part of it when we don't have the schedule yet, and typically we wouldn't approve it. I think. You know, Darian is our transit expert, and we had a really well-respected consultant who helped pull all of this together. And I, you know, personally, knowing that having all of the passes work on Coralville Transit, having free transfers to Coralville, and having transfers at every bus stop moving forward one month from now, to me, that's really important as critical improvements to the transit system that I think are widely needed and will be significant improvements. And it doesn't make sense to me to delay other parts of it that may be a problem when we've heard very clearly that our transit system will continue to take feedback and make adjustments if we need to make adjustments if there are kinks that need to be worked out. So I'm in favor of moving forward tonight so we can get those pieces moving. I would love to know what you mean by micromanagement. Do you mean like giving people free service? When I ask her to do free service for low income people, that's micromanaging. Or do you mean like when we ask her to wait for more feedback, that's micromanagement? I was talking about waiting to see the schedule and then have us approve the schedule. That wasn't something, I mean, to me, that would be like approving snow plow routes. I think that's- I that said, would... I wanna ensure that if some people have uh, as a, uh, somewhere else arise with a concern, just like the West side to be with that in consideration. 
-hmm. no one here is micromanaged, but at the end of the day, staff cannot just do things like that. We are here, the elected official who look at the people concerned and bring it to the staff. And that's the concern that I've been reached out by a lot of people telling me about it. And I have to speak about it. And regarding the free fee, we have the power to tell the staff, make it free for low income people. And now I really encourage that today we have to decide that even if we want to vote for it, I really put a motion to make the you know, low income people have free right today, give clear direction to the staff. You are muted, Mayor. Sound like there's a motion on the floor to give um, free fare to low income individuals. Can I get a second, please? Second, Taylor. Okay. All right, we can discuss that now. We had discussion early on about how we were gonna move forward with this and how, I mean, we had a, we had a pretty detailed um, presentation and how we were gonna move forward on which pieces and at which point in time. I think to make this sort of change um, without specific definition of what constitutes low income and exactly what the financial implications are for the transit system in the city um, is not a prudent way to do this. I think if we want to do this, and I expressed my support earlier for trying to expand this, that we need to ask staff to come back with more detailed information so we fully understand the implications of it and the impacts of it. I don't think this is wise to take a quick motion off the floor to make this significant of a change. So I would not support it at this time. I'm not saying I won't support it overall. It's just the process without having more specific data. Let me explain to the rest of the council. Right now, we have a current system on the water department where there is a form I used to have it myself a long time ago. You fill it out, you take it to the DHS, they stamp it, and they send it back to the city council, uh, to the city. And that will qualify you as a low income person to, there is already a system in place. It could be the same thing and we can do that now. It's not like there is no system and we need to create a system. This is simple. If all of us agree that low income people are supposed to get free rider, we can just ask the city staff and approve the whole program and say, we approve that you also give low income people free rider, F figure out the plan, figure out the, you know, the mechanism that you can use to make sure those people are low income. But if they prove and they are low income, they should get it. That's what I mean. That doesn't mean like we're not approving this or anything, but the city have, Already this, if we can bring things in, something back to us again, why you don't bring the schedule then? We are saying now we wanna approve all this together, making sure low income getting, you know, the, the free right, making sure you have public, you consider public comment and work. If you, if something issue arise somewhere else, you work with them and also we're gonna approve everything today. Why not? And now because of low income, we have to come back. There is a mechanism in place with the city. Mayor Pro Tem, did you want to qualify what you meant by low income as far as like percentage of the median income or or like low to moderate? Did you want to clarify that with a percentage? Yeah, just the, and as that the poverty guideline that the DHS used to call to, to like assign people as a low income. What we have now, we have current system at the utility department, the water department, where people, they fill out the, you know, somebody can remind me about the name of the program, but with, there is a form the city created, they give it to people who think they are low income and they take it to the DHS and DHS will say, yes, 
we provide their income, they receive such benefit that make them low income, which is food stamp, you know, any DHS benefit, like whether it's food stamp, Medicaid, and WIC. I don't, I don't have before me the, the presentation that we went through where there was numbers about um, what it would cost. Uh, I assume if we had certain riders go free, um, I don't know if Jeff or Darian have any of that before you right now. So, sorry, Jeff, are you gonna go ahead? Okay. Um, so Mayor, we, as part of the, the formal transit study, we did a formal evaluation of the zero fare ridership um, and what that would, uh, what those costs associated with that would be and the increase in ridership. We did not look specifically at a low income fare program. However, that is something that we would, um, we have been talking with Coralville as we've been trying to um, really align all of our fare and transfer policies. And that is something that we, um, we, were, we had both considered um, to be a priority to do in, in concert together so that we can, again, make sure that, um, that we, those fares um, and those, uh, those uh, uh, passes, excuse me, are, are used on, are able to be used on both systems. So I don't have I don't have a number for you in terms of the low income fare, and that's that would be our that would be um, what we would have wanted to evaluate next is to just have some more formal evaluation of who would all qualify in the community. I mean, there's different ways we could do this. Um, as um, as uh, Mayor Pro Tem mentioned, you, you could make it so it's a if the city if the, a person qualifies through a city discount program for low income already. It could potentially qualify for uh, for a pass. It could be based on um, the percentage of area median income. There's different ways you could approach it. Um, I think the the cost associated with it, um, that piece of it would need to be, if we wanted to look further into that, that piece would need to be further evaluated, and that would be based off of um, the same data that our transit consultant team did um, to perform our other um, analysis relating to the fare. So really, we were hoping to reach out to them to do an add-on. Um, that was uh, that was the way that we were going to get that information um, to be able to bring back to the council as to what those associated costs might be of a low-income fare program. Mayor, can I just tell you something about this? They they already approved that people who receive Medicare and people who are 65 years old. Do you know how many immigrants over 70 years old and they are not qualified for Medicare? Because they did not, either they came this country and they don't have enough uh, working hours to be qualified for Medicare, they never work or they work few hours, or they are not still US citizen to be like getting the aging SSI, which is social security disability. There is many, many families. The problem is that the people look at typical Iowan who are 65 older and have Medicaid and they give them free bus. And this is come with the plan automatically right now being approved without thinking about the low income people who are really in need and they will be even 65 or 70, but they are not, they cannot even you know have Medicare or anything to prove that they are low income. So I, I really encourage all that the people who are low income really to see if you think about 65 year old who have Medicaid and who could be rich and have Medicare because of their working you know history, they eligible for Medicare and they still have free fair that been approved already on this system. And think about low income people that we said, okay, let us the staff think about it. Why the staff did not think about this before bring this? But I'm sure hundred percent if that's on the radar, they will do it. I, I, I'm, I'm sure because I, I hear Jeff before said he would like even to go free fair. You know, I, I think we can approve this for low income and ask the staff to come up with the mechanism to verify if the people are low income or not. I appreciate um, your comments. I did want to make sure that if there's anyone else that want to comment, that we have some time for you to make comments. 
I do have a follow-up comment for myself though. I just want to clarify the proposed fair structure does say senior is a free pass. So that's already included in the proposed fair structure. If you look on page 918 through 9, about 945 or so, there's all these different possible fair structures that take all these different considerations into effect. And I heard Darian say that they're looking to bring this back to us with some more specific data. And so I'm, I mean, and, and I also want us to consider not means testing it and talking about what is it, you know, looking at fair free overall, because we know that has lower administrative costs and, you know, is quantifiable to something we can maybe try and accomplish without having to parse it out. I can mention, um, we've, we've been looking at fair free transit for a couple of years. Um, with the hope that we can we can find a way to do it, not just for low income, but for everybody. We think that's really important uh, to meet our climate action goals. Um, and, um, you know, I'd like to think that absent the, the pandemic, we would probably be in a position where we could pursue that right now. We had some ideas for permanent funding sources, um, but all that kind of came to a screeching halt with, with COVID and how that impacted our transportation services budget. Um, even as we're coming out of this, we're still 50% down uh, in ridership pre-COVID. Um, and, and that has a real financial impact on the system too. So you have to be able to, to pick up that gap and then pay for that, that fare free transit. And then hopefully be in a position to expand your transit service because it will be used more. And that'd be a great, great thing to be in. Um, we had considered um, using some actually some, some uh, parking fund revenues to transfer over to transit to be able to do that. Um, unfortunately, um, probably the only budget that's been hit harder than transit is parking, and that's limited our ability to, to, to fund it. Um, we do have some um, uh, uh, federal relief dollars that can be targeted towards um, expanded transit service. And we had that discussion with you in, in the fall about um, Sunday tr uh, transit, and, and as Darian pointed out in March, you all gave us the green light to do a two-year pilot um, with some of those federal funds that we received. Um, we can do uh, fare-free pilots with um, those same federal funds, but the council needs to have that discussion um, and 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 put that initiative on you know on the same table with everything else that those funds can be used for. And then we really have to think long and hard about how we sustain that after the after the um, um, after that, after that pilot period, uh, no one's going to want to offer two years of popular service enhancement and free fares, only not to have an ability to pay for it um, uh, afterwards. So, I, I hear, I hear the call for um, expanding the free offerings. I absolutely think we can do that, but I think we need to be planful about how we do that. We need to project out what those costs will be, and not only how we will pay for them in the short run. Um, but also how we will pay for them potentially in the long run after that, after those federal dollars are essentially exhausted. Um, uh, so we can absolutely come back to you. Um, as you can tell, this, this has been a massive undertaking and we do have to stage these things. We don't have staff capacity to do all this at once and we'd love to do it at once. Um, our first step was to get the fares lined up. That'll happen and we'll, we'll launch that next month. And then we'll um, hopefully, uh, with your approval, begin the uh, route changes in August. And then we immediately turn our attention to that implementation of the Sunday service, um, which is a huge undertaking. Uh, if you just think from, a, from an operational standpoint to add another day to your operations, to hire more staff, redo all the staffing schedules, bring in more mechanics, uh, all, that, all that kind of overhead that goes with it, that's a massive undertaking. And that late night, um, late owl or night owl piece is, is kind of that, that, uh, that, that next rung after Sunday service. So we're marching along with the capacity that we have. I think we're making really smart changes here. Um, to your earlier points, we are going to realize that, that there are some adjustments that are made. I, I just cannot believe we can make sweeping changes like this and, and get it 100% right. So, we as staff expect that we'll have to make some tweaks, whether that's schedules or stop locations or even route 
locations, where the turnaround needs to be, we should expect that we're going to have to make some adjustments because as, as much outreach as we try to do, we won't reach everybody. And hopefully we'll entice more people to want to ride the bus and they'll have some suggestions too. So expect all this. Um, it's, it's, it's exciting to work on. I think we're headed on the right direction, but it's not going to be, we, we can't do everything at once. We're just going to have to um, take these, take these in stages. Again, if, if fare free, whether full or, or um, targeted is, is a priority, we can absolutely do that. Um, we just want to make sure it doesn't stop our progress on the other pieces of it. And we want to make sure we're financially in the position to be able to, to sustain that. I don't know you, what you mean by really, you know, like fair, I know that the fair free, it will be taking some time until we figure out exactly what we want to do. I just want to make sure everybody understand my proposal. My proposal is to give direction to the staff to find a mechanism to give low income people free fare. So if if I understand correctly, and a part of my follow up was to um, suggest that we give direction to the staff to figure to out the that, mechanism, yeah, to to come back and you know with the option of free fare for low income individuals, we know that the zero fare for all was something that we received. It we at that time did not okay that. Um, it's a great hope in the future, but I do believe that um, coming back to council uh, with, you know, what would it look like for free fare? I, I think that is um, something that we should do for low income individuals. I want to specify that and give definitions to that. So I don't know if um, if there are individuals. So Mayor Pro Tem, I know that the motion was to, um, I think the motion was to do it, but stop. really the motion is to come back. To give us that direction to figure out a mechanism for free fare for low income people. It, is okay. this intended to be effective with all the other fare changes next month? Is that, what about, are you giving the senior and the Medicare holder affected like months? Yes, we're, we're, we're currently on schedule to do all the fare changes next month. Why, why not for those, if you can figure out, how did you figure out the senior and the, the Medicare recipient? How are you gonna evaluate that? Do you have a mechanism in place? Yeah, the mechanism would be the Medicare card or the SEEDS card. They actually have a card issued to them. Okay, those people also, they have food stamp card, SNAP card, or uh, they have, uh, you know, another like human uh, Medicaid card, which is Medicaid, that means low income. And also they have, uh, they have uh, the, the cash, you know, assistant, the, 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 the FIP card too. And they have also the WIC card. They, they, they have card for everything, if that what you want. Is there a time, and, and, and I want to make sure that I'm getting all of council's feedback. Um, my, I, I guess I'll ask the question if council is interested, um, majority of council want to look at um, low income opportunities for uh, free fare or even reduce fare, um, but it would be a mechanism uh, as Mayor Pro Tem has mentioned. So do I have uh, and you can maybe shake your head as far as council's interest in having staff look into that. We have a motion on the floor and now you're suggesting something that I'm not sure is directly the same as the motion. The motion was to approve. To, to add give direction to the staff that they will figure out the mechanism, just the same mechanism that they figured out for the, you know, Use the same mechanism they figured it out for the, you know, the, the Medicare recipient and use the same thing for low income. So, so that's, that's the uh, clarified motion on the floor. So then I guess yeah. at this. Well, I'm just still confused. I, I thought the mayor pro tem's motion was that the city will do this as opposed to the city will look into doing this, I think. 
that was maybe my understanding, and I don't want to speak for the mayor pro tem, but my understanding of her, her motion and the second was that the city will do this. How they do it, how they figure out how to, uh, to define who's a low income person. I think the mayor pro tem is suggesting that if you have a FIP or you have SNAP benefits or a WIC card, but, but I think we have to make sure that what we're voting on, if it's we will do it or we will look into it. Mayor Pro Tem, will you clarify your motion or did you just clarify your motion? Before I clarify my motion, let me ask this question. I just asked Darian that how she figured out it for Medicaid, Medicare people. She said they have a Medicaid card. That means it's not like really tough job to do. If you provide your card for as a low income, that will qualify you. If I have Medicaid card, I'm bringing it to you. And if I have food stamp card or like we card or anything and I show it to the people that means I can write for free just like the Medicaid recipient can you tell me what's the difficulty on figuring out that this, this is for Darian and Jeff so I so let me clarify so I, what I what I thought you were asking was um how do you know when they when they when they board the bus whether they have Medicare and they and they 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 show their card how Medicare, the discount was included in the evaluation was part of the consultant's recommendations because of, because we're a federal transit agency, um, we, um, I believe there's a federal requirement for a discounted um, service for Medicare. I think this is a, it's a, it's a federal requirement. Um, so when they evaluated that federal requirement and how we were fulfilling that before, which was uh, a 50, was it a 50%? I can't recall if it was a 50% discount or if it was, it was service. We carried that over Great. into the recommendations going forward. So that's kind of where that the origin of that piece of it was, if that's what you were asking. Yeah, it is It is free. It, you said it's free if they are, have Medicare. Yes. And now the problem was here, even Susan Elia, she mentioned that she, she think people who are low income should do that. And now, why we're not doing it now? Why are we waiting if there is also the same mechanism that you can use for, for uh, verifying if the person like Medicare or not? Because you can use me, the same thing. Because to me, Mayor Pro Tem, th what you're asking us to do is a decision on the fly without looking into and making sure we're clear on the financial ramifications of this and planning for it. Maybe it is something that staff can come back to us in a month or six weeks and say, yeah, we can do it. But to me, we went through a major presentation that we approved weeks or few months ago on how we were going to do this. And we talked even then about what we were gonna do with free fare and looking into those different things. I don't believe that it is prudent or responsible for the council to make a decision that could have significant financial ramifications without understanding what that is. As soon as we can reasonably get that information, I am very interested in in looking at having people who qualify for SNAP or other things to get reduced or free fares. But I want the analysis before I make that decision. But I the analysis is for what? As counselors. I'm gonna qualify my motion now. So we gotta move forward on this. To give direction to the city, to figure out the mechanism, to evaluate how they can, we, how we can give prefer to low income people. Okay, so that was a clarification of the motion. And then um, Councillor Taylor, you seconded that. Do you still second that motion? Yes. Okay, all right. I, I would just make one clarification in my interpretation of that. Directing staff to indicate how they would determine does not say that we are approving, it does not say that we are approving the free or reduced fare. Those are two different things. 
I, I agree. I almost think that we can, um, personally, I think the motion could be withdrawn and we just direct staff to do that without a motion on the floor. No, but we want them to give them free therapies and figure out the mechanism. That's what I'm proposing. And I'm not approving, I'm not, I'm not ready to approve the free fair until I see a financial analysis of it. Okay, that's up to you. But I, I'm, I'm asking now, Mayor, when I say we want them to do it, that means we agree to give low income people free fair, but because in the beginning, the problem was how the staff can figure out the mechanism. It wasn't like uh, how much it's gonna, I don't know when they say analysis, they mean how many low income in the city. And if there is a lot of people, that means that we're gonna lose a lot of money. And I, I don't know what the mechanism that they're talking about, the, the, the analysis that she's talking about. But I'm really saying that since we're giving Medicare recipient, free services, we should good low-income people, at least Medicare, they receive, uh, you know, benefit, they receive retirement, but low-income people, some of them, they have zero income. Zero income, they depend on the, on food stamp, public housing, all this. They're more vulnerable than the Medicare recipient. Okay, so I think I understand the motion now, and I want to make sure that um, everyone understands the motion so that we can bring this to a vote. So essentially, Mayor Pro Tem is saying that we would, this motion will uh, require um, reduced, wait, free fare for low income individuals and that the staff will come back and tell us who is all within that qualification. Is that? the understanding. And even if you need to figure out the mechanism after one month or two, it's okay. But at the end, if they are low income, zero, in, like low income, they should get free fare. That's what I really mean. Okay. But if the staff need time for that, to figure out the mechanism, to evaluate people whether they are low income or not, that's okay. Okay. I think I want to go ahead and open this up for a vote. If anyone has any Quick comments, I think maybe when you vote, you can give a quick comment. If people are okay with that. All right, roll call, please. It's a roll call on the motion, right? To the... Yeah. Okay, Sully? Yes. Okay, Taylor? Yes. Teague? No, but I do want to bring it back to a work session. Thomas? Uh, no, but I, I would like, I'm inclined always to, you know, remove barriers uh, to, to the uh, service. However, you know, is it a question of free? Is it a question of reduced? What are the financial impacts? I, I mean, I do think we owe it to the community as a whole, you know, to have a, a separate discussion where this thing is, is discussed in detail. Weiner? Um, no, please bring it to the next work session so that we can have so that we can discuss this, please. Fergus. No, and I look forward to staff bringing us the information they already said they were going to bring on this issue. Mims. No. Okay, motion fails um, two to five. Does Who anyone? The I said no. Oh, I saw Pauline. Okay, sorry. It's yes, just okay. five. Two to five. Okay. Okay. All right. So we have a. Um, could I get a motion to approve the Iowa City Area Transit Study Plan and recommended transit system changes? So move, Mims. Mayor, we already have that. That was oh, the original motion, correct? That motion is still on the floor, correct? Yeah, it was Mims and Burgess. All right. Thank you. And then we'll do council discussion there. Unless we are ready for roll call. I think we're ready for roll call, please. Taylor. Was that Taylor? Yes, I'm sorry, Taylor, yes. Uh, that would be yes. Okay. Teague? Yes. Thomas? 
Yes. Weiner? Yes. Fergus? Yes. Mims? Yes. Sully? Yes. Motion passes seven and one. Can I get a motion to accept correspondence? So move, Mims. Second, Weiner. Moved by Mims, second by Weiner. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Motion passed. I'm sorry. Well then, I, I really couldn't understand this. I'm are sorry. Are we <laughs> voting for the tra transit where we went back to the, you know, the, the price of the fare? I don't know. Is this two separate motion? Mm -hmm. So this is just a, the current motion on the floor is to accept correspondence. No, the first one that we just passed. Yeah, so the first How many one, motion? We have one for the fair, one for the one that I bought, and one for the whole thing, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. So the one that we just finished before this one was the one for I would say the whole thing for the transit plan. No, Change. for the whole thing, I'm voting no. Okay. Saying that, please. Okay. Um, I'm gonna finish the motion on the floor. And this is the motion to accept correspondence. And then only because Councillor Taylor, <laughs> I had already moved to uh, any one in, neg in the negative and you said I, so I just wanna make sure that I understood if you're a vote for correspondence, if you voted for or against the correspondence. That, uh, that, that was a delay, that was a delay. Okay, so I have seven. So the motion passes seven to zero for the correspondence. And Zoom did delay. All right. So I'm going to need some guidance from our interim city attorney. Um, Mayor Pro Tem stated that the motion prior, where we did the um, move to approve the Iowa City Area Transit Study Plan and recommended, and recommended transit system changes. She stated yes, but she wanted her vote to be in the negative of no. Right, I think that was, because just this understanding of the item on the floor at the time and that the, clearly her intent was to vote no, that she indicated. So we will, it can be shown as, as a six to one vote. Okay. Thank you. Any it's six to one? Six to one on the on the big plan. I think I heard somebody else said no. No, it was six to one. Okay. We're going to move on to item number 15, which is the city attorney appointment. Resolution appointing Eric R. Goers as city attorney and authorizing the mayor to sign and the city clerk to attest an employment agreement. Can I get a motion to approve, please? So moved, Mims. Second, Fergus. All right, anyone from the public like to address this topic? If so, please raise your hand and I'll call upon you. Seeing no one, council discussion. Just excited to welcome Eric as our new city attorney. Glad to have this move forward. Absolutely. So welcome to Eric if um, he should get the votes for this. All right. Roll call, please. Uh, Teague. Yes. Thomas. Yes. Weiner. Yes. Fergus. Yes. Mims. Yes. Sully. Yes. Taylor. Yes. Motion passes seven to zero. Item 16 is council appointments. 16 uh, applicants must reside in Iowa City and be 18 years of age unless specified qualifications are stated. 16A is Community Police Review Board. Um, and this is Community Police Review Board, one vacancy at large to fill a four year term July 1st, 2021 through June 30th, 2025. And council discussion. Uh, 
it has to be male. So there are only like three choices in this group, I think. Was four weren't there? Maybe, maybe, but in any event, there's it's limited there number. Were. I didn't have any real strong feelings on any of them. I'm curious to see what others think. I'd put forward um, Saul Meckes. I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce uh, his name. Notice his application is more recent. Yeah, I've known Saul for years. He did from I way back when I was at Kirkwood Community College, I think he would do fine. I just had concerns that uh, he said that he had no real in-depth knowledge of, of the commission. Uh, he subscribes to the Press Citizen to, to keep informed. I just had, had some concerns about that because most of the others uh, looked, at least looked at the minutes or uh, had uh, even sat in on some of the meetings. I, I was looking at either uh, Bruce Sodal or, or uh, Willie Goodell but I'm open. I frankly was surprised at the lack of knowledge of all of them, really. I didn't think there was much there um, of, of real, yeah, of, of really looking a whole lot at it. And I guess for me, I can, I can, I, I do understand Councillor Taylor's concern about Saul. I did notice that, um, you know, I, I didn't have a strong opinion um, at supporting anyone specifically. So I can certainly be open to Saul um, or Bruce. I have a quick question for Kelly. Um, when people have an application that's more than a year old, like a few of these, um, what's the process for letting them know their application is still up for consideration? Sure. So um, at the time it was announced, it wouldn't have been a, a year old. That's kind of when they drop off. Um, but they do get, when, when there's an opening, they do get an email saying that there's a vacancy and you'll, your application will be um, up for consideration and then it gives them uh, a section to opt out if they'd like their, their application pulled. Thank you. The one, I guess, I don't know if you call it a concern. I, I think some members of the public would question us appointing somebody who um, part of what he has done has been teaching um, self-defense and has utilized law enforcement input and even instructed techniques to law enforcement. I'm not saying I have a problem with that, but I think some members of the public will when we're talking about appointment to kind of oversee and, and you know, look at complaints against law enforcement. Um, and the other two candidates, other than Saul, neither of them indicated they had any knowledge of the commission. So I would support Saul. I can support Saul as well. Okay, sounds like we have a majority supporting um, Saul Mikis. Uh, I should know it, but it's been a long time. <laughs> okay. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem is having internet connections, just so that people know. Um, so we'll continue with the appointment of Saul Mikis. Um, could I get a motion to appoint Saul? So moved. Second. Moved by Burgess, seconded by Taylor. All yep. in favor say aye. 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 Any oppose? Motion passes six to zero. 
Um, can I get a motion to accept correspondence? So moved, Nims. Second, Fergus. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passed to six to zero. All right. Announcement of vacancies previous. Applicants must reside in Iowa City and be 18 years of age unless specific qualifications are stated. Um, airport zoning board of adjustment, one vacancy to fill a five-year term. Board of adjustments, one vacancy to fill a five-year term. This is licensed electrician for board of appeals. Historic Preservation Commission, East College Street, one vacancy to fill an unexpired plus a three-year term. Historic Preservation Commission, North Side, one vacancy to fill a three-year term. Historic Preservation Commission, Woodlawn, one vacancy to fill an unexpired plus a three-year term. Vacancies will remain open until filled. 17A, announcements of vacancies new. Human Rights Commission, one vacancy to fill an unexpired term ending December 31st, 2021. And applicants, applications must be received by 5 p.m. Tuesday, July 13th, 2021. And we get correspondence. Can I get a motion to accept correspondence? So moved, Mims. Second, Fergus. All in favor say aye. 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 Yep. We're, we're having internet lagging or something. Any oppose? Motion passes seven to zero. Item number 18, um, USI UISG. Hello, Anna. Um, hope you're having a good night. I just have one quick announcement tonight since I know it's getting a little late. Um, the university just has a revised mask policy um, that reflects changes to the city. So um, students and faculty are not required to wear a mask if they're vaccinated unless in um, a healthcare facility or on um, a campus system. So um, have a great night, everyone. Thank you. Great. And then city council updates item number 19. I, I had an, uh, just an item, uh, since we didn't do the committee reports earlier, uh, the mayor pro tem and I are on the rules committee and we actually did have a meeting. We don't meet very often, but uh, we did just a couple weeks ago as we voted on item 6B in our consent agenda. Uh, we um, approved the bylaws uh, that were submitted to us by the uh, TRC. Uh, and I want to thank them for their work in, in uh, writing their bylaws. They utilized uh, ones from other boards and commissions as uh, examples, while at the same time uh, adding some language that was specific to uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So uh, good job uh, to them. That's all. So I don't have a report on a board, but I just wanted to remind everybody there's a special election for Johnson County Supervisor on June 8th. You can vote early um, at the Johnson County Auditor's Office and there's satellite voting this weekend, I believe both Saturday and Sunday at the Iowa City Public Library, um, Saturday in North Liberty and Sunday at Coralville. So please vote. Mayor Preston, we can't hear you. Yeah, we can't hear you, Mayor Pro Tem. No, it looks like she's frozen. Mm -hmm. The internet has been having issues all across <laughs> the city. It's been terrible tonight. I'll be so glad to get back in person. <laughs> yes. Any other updates? Well, maybe we can just mention, I think at our work session, did we talk about when we're going to be back in person and to uh, mention that at this meeting, which I think we said first meeting in July at the senior center in the assembly room. So that's very exciting. Yes. Better remind us or we'll show up on Zoom instead. <laughs> yes. 
All right. Um, if Mayor Pro Tem jumps back on, if she has any updates, certainly she can give them. We're gonna move on to item number 20. And this is reports from our city staff, our city manager. I'd just like to congratulate the council on your uh, choice for city attorney. I'm very excited to have uh, Eric assume that position. Uh, very, uh, very good choice there. And again, wanna just congratulate you. Um, also wanna thank Sue Dulick for her time as interim uh, city attorney, uh, uh, as we all expected and knew, she was uh, uh, she was fantastic uh, in that capacity, and will continue to be a um, a huge um, uh, positive uh, force on our on our city staff. So uh, uh, things are looking good in the city attorney's office, and thank the council for your your diligence through that process. Um, also want to say uh, thank you to Ashley Monroe, our deputy city manager. This is Ashley's last meeting with us. Uh, she has uh, been with us for about five years now, I'll give it kind of an approximate uh, uh, time. Um, and she's done some fantastic things for our organization. Um, we're going to be sad to see her go, but uh, excited for her and her family as they uh, move back across the Mississippi into into Illinois territory um, uh, in uh, Riverside, Illinois. So thank you, Ashley, for your service to Iowa City. Uh, we'll miss you, but uh, we'll certainly wish you uh, the best. That's all, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, of course, we have to say thanks to our um, deputy city manager, Ashley Monroe, who will be leaving us, as Jeff mentioned, last day next week. So thanks for all you've done. And yes, we welcome you to say some parting words on your last day. <laughs> I will keep it short and sweet. Um, thank you to everyone um, for the opportunity. It's been an honor. I will miss Iowa City. I will miss uh, I will miss staff and working with each of you. It's been wonderful to work with all the council members, um, both present and past. And um, again, enjoyed my time here and thank you. All right. Yes. All right. And then our interim city attorney, we have to say thanks for stepping in and allowing us to get through this uh, time without Eleanor. So thanks to you. Any words from you tonight? Uh, no, you're welcome and good night. <laughs> Great. <laughs> we'll see more of you. We already know this. Um, and then our city clerk. Nothing from me. Thank you. All right. Could I get a motion to adjourn, please? So moved. I'm number 21. Moved by MIMS. Seconded by, Seconded by Weiner. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? We are adjourned. Good night, everyone. Good night. Yes.